Good morning everyone and welcome to this year's annual KVH and Zespri Joint Biosecurity Day. Thanks to all our presenters and de demonstrators who are here to share their expertise and experiences in biosecurity with us. We have a series of presentations and demonstrations today showcasing latest research and technology initiatives underway to protect the New Zealand kiwifruit industry from unwanted pests and diseases. Before we start, uh, we have the Slido app set up today. So this will allow you to ask questions and make comments anonymously during the day. You'll find the QR code for this on your agenda, which is on your seat. You can scan the code and ask questions and we'll give feedback at the end. Also on the agenda is QR codes to download the Onside app, if you wish to, which is free, and you can learn more about the spotted lanternfly a pest that we're hearing a lot about today. Just going to housekeeping, um, if there is a fire and the alarms go off, we will exit through the main doors and go out the auditorium and we'll um, congregate outside the front of the church. The fire assembly point is beyond there at the volleyball court. The bathroom locations, when you exit this room, turn left, go right down to the end and then turn left again. The toilets are down there. So just going through today's expectations, which are all centered around when we're being fed. So before morning tea, there'll be a series of presentations from Zespri and KVH. We'll be joined virtually by Dr. Julie Urban, who's a spotted lanternfly expert from the United States. We'll hear from KVH's biosecurity advisors on work that's being done on our high risk pests, Learn more about going behind the scenes for a biosecurity response. After morning tea, we'll look at wild kiwi fruit from space and how we spot it. And then we'll look at uh, unusual symptoms on vines and also the new uh, plant health and environment laboratory in Auckland. Uh, this will be followed by a demonstration session where you can ask questions, interact and learn from the presenters. Uh, and for this, we'll break into groups. We'll rotate between the different stands, which will showcase exciting new tools and technologies for the kiwi fruit biosecurity. So our first speaker today is Dr. Chandon Tao. Chandon has been with Zespri for one and a half years. Chandon leads the Zespri biosecurity uh, industry resilience uh, for, bi for biosecurity in Mount Maunganui. And he works to coordinate cutting edge research to deliver the best possible biosecurity outcomes for the industry. So over to you, Chandon. So thanks, Leanne. Um, so it's great to be back in after a year to give some uh, biosecurity um, R&D updates. So it's great to be here. So to start, um, biosecurity innovation team. Uh, we're a team of three and two of us here, one in, based in Italy. And our job is to find science solution to prepare uh, and help especially KBH and the industry for you know, future biosecurity incursion. And we do different kinds of settings of work, for example, you know, surveillance, research innovation, risk evaluation for different pests and disease. And on our list, we have more than 100 pests and disease, and mainly focused nowadays at uh, the top 20, because every single pest of disease, you have to do a lot of things, so there's a lot of work there. So to make sure we can prepare, because those are the no problems right now, but if they come to the country, we're not going to have the time to work on that. So we have to make sure we are ready for those situations and work towards that. So I'm going to give some highlights for the special two, special um, uh, one is pathogens from serocystis, one fungal pathogens, another one BMSB, probably you heard a lot. Uh, so serocystis, this is how it looks when, it, when you put it on a plate. It looks quite a little bit ugly, but some people might find it interesting. Uh, serocystis, um, this one already present in New Zealand, but it's a different form. You will find um, black rot on Kumara here. But in Brazil, there's a, especially this one has a really, um, really narrow host range. Some of those ones are really specific to some uh, specific uh, host, but those ones, especially in Brazil or South America, they're really in you know, a wide range of host. And we're especially interested in those ones because if they come to the country, they can, they can kind of attack not only um, the key fruit, could be some other host as well. 
So you can see they can cause different kind of symptoms. Uh, in, in Brazil especially, they can cause up to 50% of the buying loss in some cases. So are we ready for serotocystis? Probably we're, we're halfway through, nearly we'll be, we'll be probably working towards that one. So, so far what, what we have done is we tested different, um, different isolates from Brazil and Hawaii uh, to our uh, New Zealand cultivars, and all, all of them are susceptible, so it's quite a risk for us. In terms of diagnostics and in early detection, we developed a diagnostic PCR test, so we can really kind of rule out what is already here and identify what exactly the ones we actually targeted for. In terms of labor of management, we had a look at bio 500, which is similar to ActiGuard, actually can reduce infection. So it is like a good news for us because ActiGuard already used as elicitor for PSA control, so it could be like a, in one story can do for two different things. Um, today I'm going to give it, give it an overview on the pathogen movement within plants and how pruning tools, if pruning tools actually can spread the disease. And what we have done so far, a little bit of preliminary work and if we can actually sanitize the pruning tools. So, so far we tested just only a few products and hot water kind of stand out, but still a lot of more products need to be tested because it's not really practical to use hot water, probably the orchard. So certain movement within plants. Um, so if you look, we, we, we actually did some um, glass house trial and when we infected those plants and then from the top in the apex or the bottom at the, um, at the stem, the infection actually goes towards up almost three times. It's because, you know, probably those uh, fungal actually block the xylem uh, and the xylem um, tissues. That's why it doesn't really, nutrients and water doesn't really go through upwards. That's what you could see on the right, uh, G3 plants sometimes can die within 30 days, whereas when the infection comes from the top, it actually can survive, but still, uh, so it's kind of telling you that prunings is not going to help if the infection come from the, uh, come from the root system. But if from the you know, air or something, some, uh, some infection comes from the top, worse, for example, branches, still uh, pruning might work a little bit. So can really, so serotonin can is really spread through pruning tools. So we did some glass house trial again, and we could see, yes, almost 20% incidence means one in five cases, you know, it, it can actually um, uh, transfer infection from you know, infected plant to the healthy plant. Because maybe inoculum level is quite low, so, uh, but it's kind of highlights that pruning tools actually can transfer disease. So where are we going, what next? So what we're trying to do for certain readiness is we're, we're trying to more checking some rootstock that's already been tested as a, a, a resistance to a resistance um, rootstock. So we're trying to graft it our cultivars onto that and see if, if it actually works. We're trying to see pathogen movement from soil to healthy plants. Uh, we're trying some more host specificity, especially trying some, uh, some of those isolates from other crops, especially almonds, mango, uh, eucalyptus, and other, other pathogens. So pathogens from those hosts and see that actually they can infect our key fruit as well. So we'll be testing more sanitizing, um, sanitizing options. So if we have, we already tested few, so we'll see some of those ones we already here used for PSA. Uh, pruning tool sanitization, can that will work for serotonin as well. And ActiGuard, we'll be working on more ActiGuard elicitors, see if we can reduce infection further. And we'll be trying more commercially bioavailable um, uh, biocontrol agents, especially in the coming years. And BMSB space, so BMSB um, is a problem in some other countries, not especially not this key food growing region in New Zealand, but and you know, has a, um, some other key food region everywhere is, is a, BMSB is everywhere. And at the border, uh, we see live BMSB inter interception every year. Uh, so definitely it's kind of knocking at the door. So you have to make sure we have time still to prepare something for the next couple of years because incursion can happen any time. Um, so we kind of giving some case study, you know, what we actually notice what's happening in EU. So for example, Italy, we could see the last few years, you know, um, Almost 23% orchard was um, where we could see BMSB in 2018, and it gone up to 40%. So once they come to the country, it could readily spread across you know different region. And it cost in the northern Italy almost 600 million. So what are the control options they have? So which, what we're trying to do, you know, we're developing a lot of tools and trying to look and look at those countries and see what are they are doing, so we can learn something, and bring it back knowledge, bring that knowledge back to our New Zealand growers. So in terms of control, you know, chemical control is still um, at the first uh, major option. 
and especially the border in the border areas where the BMSB pressure is quite high. So this case is uh, two special special uh, uh, broader spectrum um, broader spectrum uh, chemicals, etofen prox and delta methylene actually works. And other ones in netting systems quite working pretty well. And hailing system is quite common in in, in, in France and Italy. And you could see for the last few years um, exclusion netting actually growing up in Italy. So nowadays, chemical control and netting system kind of giving a good result. So this probably would be the first two uh, priorities, you know, if we may come to the country as a control options. Other than that, a um, lot of BMS the trap they're using for monitoring as a monitoring tool. So, um, Euro, so especially the Italian region, so there's a regional uh, monitoring system. So there's a uh, BMSB can traps, it's kind of everywhere. So growers also putting the, some of those traps near to the orchard, so they can, kind of, they can actually look at what are the incidence level in the BMSB, so just for the early detection and set up their different control system. So they're kind of trying, um, uh, what's that, uh, uh, pyramid traps and trace lure and actually giving kind of good results as a monitoring tool. At the same time, this is kind of trialing different kind of other monitoring traps. For example, ELP traps is a more like a electrical traps. Other one, Shindo trap is a more vibrational trap. So those ones, are, we're doing some trial there. In terms of um, innovation trial, last year we have done some work, is the um, aerodynamic traps. Um, it's more like a pheromone baited uh, wind rotated uh, traps. Yeah, and it could catch almost, you know, um, six to six to sixty-five times, uh, six, to, six times almost than normal, uh, uh, normal pyramid traps. In some cases, um, almost sixty-five times for aesthetic panels. So, it's, a, it's not really good for the nymphs, uh, but it's good for the adults. So, it's kind of give you a good idea that um, it could be a potential option uh, for our New Zealand uh, monitoring system because now it is still used like an old-fashioned aesthetic panel. So, it could be uh, is a good option for the future. Um, BM is back biocontrol also on our radar. Uh, last, uh, oh, there's a work ongoing in China because a lot of work has been an outside New Zealand. So this work is happening in China. So what we have noticed almost uh, because summary wolves is one of those options um, that you know EPA kind of approved for conditional release if there's a BM is incursion. So that's why we're trying to understand, you know, if there's incursion, what the optimal release, you know, what, what exactly we should be doing. So, so we're kind of optimizing those um, release system. So we have seen almost 25% means one fourth, of when you release one fourth of BMSB uh, eggs actually parasitized. So three fourth still there. So there's a chance that still they can kind of go to the next generation. So in terms of optimal release, we could see one is to one ratio means every single BMSB to release um, one female um, um, summary wops. And every three consecutive works, three consecutive release means every seven days give you almost 90%. So it can go up from 25% to 90% parasitism. This is another big work happening in Italy as well, and they have noticed very similar kind of trends. So they have seen almost 24% parasitoids, um, BMS parasitoids. So it's kind of telling you what we are seeing, very similar in other countries as well. At the same time, they also picked up a lot of other local, you know, biocontrol agents. They haven't really, um, they didn't really know. So it could be kind of tell us it could happen similar here. So if we kind of release our summer reverse, there might be many more biocontrol might kind of pop up so in our system. So um, what's happening in the, so what's some of the projects is ongoing? So probably by next year, um, I'll have some more updates. So what we're doing this year is more designing a robust key footy biosecurity surveillance system, because nowadays we're kind of relying on Google reports. So is this see some, some, some unusual symptoms or some kind of unusual, uh, you know, um, uh, insect pests, so they report to us. But our our goal is to to identify those pests quite early in the system. So trying to develop a robust surveillance, surveillance system, so pick them pick them lived early. Uh, we're trying a little bit high tech system for wild creep food because wild creep food could be a reservoir for pest and disease. So uh, Andrew will tell you more about that in this afternoon. So we're trying to use remote sensing in that space. We always look for you know symptoms that we haven't really heard of or in pest and disease we haven't really heard of. So. We're trying to bring the knowledge from in overseas to New Zealand, so we're tra tra translating a lot of other languages, especially you know, Chinese, and we're trying to do South American in the future as well, and some Turkish and Iranian, so Middle, East, Middle Eastern language as well, to see if they're talking anything else that we haven't really heard of anything, so we can bring that knowledge back here. Uh, fight of diversity we're working on, so I know a lot of growers actually participated in this trial. So Phytophthora is one of our top pests as well. 
So we're trying to understand what kind of hydrops are actually present, because otherwise it's really hard to know which one we should rule out um, in the future, and if those ones are pathogenic, because some of these phytophthora can be, you know, infect, uh, can be infect some other host, for example, cowrie and others, you know, we've seen phytophthora there. So we don't know if they're going, they're going to be pathogenic for us as well, so we have to see what's actually in our watershed. Uh, spotted lanternfly, um, another pest. Uh, so we're working, some working, doing some work in China, so we're trying to do uh, some biology, biological, biological work and what the risk, risk for, for our key fruit. So some of the work is already started, so we'll have some update probably sometime in next year. And we, just, uh, we are going to start one fruit fly incursion, economic impact analysis work. Um, so by, probably we know what are the uh, economic impact if there's incursion, um, incursion happening, we have plenty. So a lot of things happening probably by next year. I'll have some lot of updates. So we're kind of working towards the readiness program for different pests, but there's a lot of things that to be done in the space. And I hope we can reach to that level in the coming years. So uh, with that, I will probably finish here. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Chandon. Um, great to see updates on all of the innovation projects and biosecurity for our most un unwanted pests. So next up we have Dr. Julie Urban, who's a spotted lanternfly expert entomologist from the United States. She'll be walking us through the impacts of spotted lanternfly and the new technology and tools used to manage it. Julie will be joining us live for questions but we're playing a recording of her talk to ensure we avoid any technical issues from overseas. Good morning, my name is Julie Urban and I'm a faculty member at Penn State University and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, after this recorded presentation, I'll be able to join you live to answer any questions you might have. And so I'm here today to share what we've learned about spotted lanternfly here in the United States. And so, I've been working on spotted lanternfly since it was first detected in the US in 2014. And so uh, today I'd like to share with you um, its basic biology and what we've learned about it uh, here in the US, um, some things that we know and some things that we're still learning. And so in terms of some of the things we're discovering, I'll also share with you um, some of the uh, innovative approaches we've tried to take to spotted lanternfly to fit the theme of your conference. And so, uh, as you likely may know, spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper. The closest relatives that most folks are familiar with are cicadas or, or um, leaf hoppers. And so here you can see that um, a, a hopper's mouth parts are fused into a straw-like beak and spotted lanternfly uses those to insert those into plant tissue and feed on plant sap, uh, specifically the plant phloem. And so uh, it was first detected here in the United States in 2014. And we estimate that it arrived here in terms it, by egg mass on a shipment of um, landscaping stone uh, from Asia. And so here you can see um, egg masses look kind of like putty or mud. And one of the things that is unusual, not just about this species of, of lanternfly, but lanternflies in, in general is that they'll lay their eggs on essentially anything. So typically um, a sap feeding insect will lay its eggs on a, a host plant um, that its nymphs, once they emerge and nymphs don't have wings because they're immature stages, typically um, you would want to lay your egg masses on something that your offspring could immediately feed upon. Uh, but lan lantern flies don't do that. Uh, they'll, they'll lay it on any, you know, even human made substances. And so um, like we have reports in, and I'll show you a few slides in a bit of them laying on trash barrels, you know, on, on vehicles and whatnot. And so why this still seems to work for them, even though these aren't viable food sources for the offspring, um, lantern fly at every life stage, but especially as early in star nymphs are highly mobile and they're, they're moving around the landscape. And so even though they're not hatched out on food, they can find food immediately. And so uh, egg masses are really hard to see. And so here you can see 
um, egg masses um, laid on, on a tree trunk and kind of the tell for a land of light egg mass is that the individual legs are laid in these um, vertical rows. Uh, oftentimes they're covered in like a, a, a waxy covering, but not necessarily always. And so as you can imagine, um, if these legs, these eggs being laid on uh, a shipment of stone or on the pallet containing the stone, it'd be, it'd be very hard uh, to detect. And so um, lanternfly is a problem for, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is because its host range is so broad. And so the most recent um, paper about this indicates that uh, worldwide, um, there are 172 host plant records for spotted lanternfly. And you know generally those are in, in the US anyway, over 100 plant taxa. And so its, it's host range is very, very large. <clears throat> but one of its preferred hosts is Tree of Heaven. And so this is a, an introduced uh, invasive here in the U.S. And it's, it's a problem for a lot of reasons. It grows in highly disturbed habitats. Uh, and so it grows along <clears throat> railroad lines and highways. So essentially transportation corridors. And so any hitchhiking uh, spotted lanternfly um, has a food source that's kind of uh, you know, lining these these transportation corridors. And Tree of Heaven, uh, when it is cut down, if it's not treated with an herbicide um, that doesn't kill it, it will <clears throat> continue to sucker underground. And you can see these little green shoots um, emerging here. And so cutting down Tree of Lantern Fly or Tree of Heaven here did not deter these lanternfly. They're still feeding on the cut stump and, and on these, these shoots. And so, as I said, lanternfly was first detected in September <clears throat> 2014 in Eastern Pennsylvania. And uh, immediately the areas where it was detected were put under a quarantine. And at the time, you can see here, this is uh, the city of Philadelphia down in the lower right. And this whole area, um, all of these counties shown in the map are, you know, represent kind of a, a, a small proportion of the state. And this is where it, it spread um, between 2014 and 2017. But here is where it is now. And so what you're seeing here in the eastern U.S., um, blue, the blue counties are counties where established lanternfly populations are, are known to exist. And so those have been put under quarantine. And what you can see here is, especially uh, this year, it's kind of spreading quite a bit. Uh, newer, uh, the, the newest um, detection of an infestation is over here in the state of Michigan. This is in uh, Pontiac, Michigan, so very near Detroit. Uh, that's just been within the last couple of weeks. And so um, in the eastern part of, of Pennsylvania, this is where it's, it, it began and it spread really throughout Pennsylvania and uh, down into Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, it's, it's especially problematic now because it's in New York City and in Baltimore and moving into Washington, D.C. And so it's in our, you know, our major urban metropolitan centers. So we're certainly on high alert for potential uh, spread to other areas. And if you look on this map, you'll also see purple dots. And these purple dots kind of speckling this whole area um, are areas in which um, lantern, hitchhiking lanternfly were detected and surveys indicated that an established population was not found. And so what this shows you is how good of a hitchhiker uh, lanternfly is. It typically gets in shipments often of nursery stock. And that's how it shows up in these other areas, but it also can, can travel you know, even with people in their vehicles. And I want to mention, even though this map is of the eastern uh, United States, uh, lanternfly has also been detected in California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, it, it is not known to be established there, uh, but it has been detected, um, in fact, multiple times in California. They're certainly under high alert because those are um, important grape growing regions uh, in the United States, as is, I, I do need to say, um, Eastern Pennsylvania is a grape growing region, but also we're very concerned now about Long Island, New York, um, known for its vineyards, and then the Finger Lakes region 
of New York over here near the Great Lakes and down uh, here um, in Pennsylvania in the Erie region. This is our, this is a, a, a area for production of Concord grapes. So Lanternfly is not yet established there. We have public awareness campaigns going on to keep folks aware of it, to try to keep it out of there. And so we see that um, uh, basically this, this is a very interesting year for Lanternfly. And when I share with you the biology, um, the year's not over yet. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what this is going to be like before the close of the year. And I do want to mention that this particular map, it's updated as needed. And so this season, it's been updated quite a bit. And it is produced by New York State Integrated Pest Management. And so you can Google NYS for New York State, IPM. SLF for Spotted Lanternfly Map and get the latest distribution. They do a really good job in keeping this updated. And so back in um, 2017, as, again, as I said, Lanternfly was first detected in 2014. Um, immediately, the USDA and Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture pulled together a, a group of a technical working group of scientists uh, to help <clears throat> advise. Um, management and, and share information on what we knew about lanternfly biology. I was a member of that group. And in 2016, I had the opportunity to come to Penn State. And so we, we had seen it in vineyards, but 2017 was like kind of a, a big year. In, in March, uh, this is a, a picture that we took in a vineyard where we were planning some insecticide trials. We saw that the posts supporting vines were just covered with many, many egg masses. So 2017 was the first year we really saw a very large and alarmingly large population. And also in 2017, this is when my student uh, doing work in that same vineyard took this video of spotted lantern fly. And so you can see um, very high numbers feeding on grapevine. They can't penetrate the actual fruit. They're feeding on the vines. You can see up here, they're also emitting you know, some excrement. And so we call that uh, honeydew. And so if you look at the image, um, you can see there's an awful lot of honeydew being excreted by these insects, which, and it, it's, uh, the, the leaves are glistening. And so that kind of gives you a sense of the, um, how voracious they are as feeders. Okay, so so certainly they like to feed on grapevines. And so in uh, 2018, this is really um, when we uh, performed, folks at Penn State uh, did the first kind of preliminary economic assessment uh, for, for spotted lanternfly. And so just in those few years uh, from 2016 to 2018, we did see damage in um, one vineyard where my student took that video. They reported over 90% yield loss in their 40 acre plant planting. They, they likely had other factors contributing to this, but um, significant yield loss, a different vineyard um, showing uh, death of an eight acre planting of Pinot Noir grapes, um, another vineyard, 45% yield reduction, and more and more vineyards kind of reporting damage. And so to try to assign numbers to that, the biggest uh, impact for five vineyards that were that were reporting damage between 2016 and 2018 um, was that they were tripling, uh, more than tripling, the number of insecticide applications uh, applied to the grapes for lanternfly. So they moved from an average of 4.2 to 14 um, insecticide sprays. And this more than tripled their insecticide cost per acre. And, and the thing is, um, that wasn't enough to uh, stop lanternfly. These are still the vineyards that reported damage. And so this is that vineyard that I mentioned that had the, the 40 acres uh, with 90% damage. Again, likely some other factors at play here. But this, you know, seeing this in 2019, this is a photo that I took was, was very devastating. And this is a, another vineyard um, overlooking uh, the city of Allentown. And again, um, not, as ex not as vast damage, but certainly some, some damage. And so uh, early on, our, our agricultural economist, Jason Harper and his, and his team did a potential um, economic impact study in Pennsylvania. And so this was based on 
uh, the value of the different industries that we anticipated lanternfly would impact from direct feeding. And I should mention that spotted lanternfly was uh, an invasive that was detected in South Korea in 2004. And so there, uh, the biggest impacts were reported for grapes, uh, but it was also reported to damage tree fruit, ornamentals, timber trees. So based on you know, um, damage assessments or based on reports of it damaging these various crops in these various habitats, um, that's what was the basis of this survey. So um, of this economic estimate. And so here in Pennsylvania alone, uh, we uh, this group estimated almost $43 million of um, impact per year, hitting fruit growers, nursery operators, and Christmas tree growers. In a worst case scenario, if, if lanternfly were to spread across the whole state, that would be almost $100 million. And then because of the reports from uh, South Korea, thinking that it could get into forests and impact our forestry industry, you can see that um, the estimates got very large. And so um, in terms of job loss and, uh, and just direct feeding damage, you know, we see very, very high, you know, estimates of overall loss, almost $90 million and uh, almost 1,000 jobs statewide per year. Worst case scenario, again, with it, yeah, uh, if it were to get throughout the whole state, um, again, you know, even much, much larger estimates. But uh, these predictions presumed what we um, pulled from the South Korean li uh, literature, and and that was, you know, they reported that spotted lanternfly will directly damage fruit and forest trees through feeding. Uh, but is this what we observed? Um, no, not really. It's not it's not quite this bad. And so uh, what we learned, uh, a colleague at the USDA, Tracy Lasky, visited uh, uh, South Korea and spoke with entomologists at, at one of their um, uh, national meetings and, and found that no, in fact, the damage was not really quantified uh, on these other crops. And so really what we're find, finding that to date, um, I hate to say, Lanternfly feeding only kills grapes and tree of heaven, but uh, it's that's bad, right? It's really bad for for grapes um, and tree of heaven. That's potentially an issue uh, for it too, in in having standing dead trees and whatnot. But we're not seeing those widespread um, impacts of lanternfly feeding on those other plants and and killing them. And so here, what I'm showing you is a vineyard, and it looks like those are, are berries uh, beneath the vines, but in fact, those are spotted lanternfly. And so as I'll describe in a bit, uh, lanternfly comes in in late season and feeds very heavily and sprays aren't enough to really keep up with, with it because this is close to harvest. And so um, there's a pre-harvest interval when any insecticides that could be applied um, need to be shorter acting uh, to maintain safety. And so this is where we see a really big problem in grapes. And so even though we saw some horrible images, um, this is, uh, I, I took this photo. Um, in, in 2017, we saw lanternfly move into uh, an area of an apple orchard and feed upon the plants. And here you see lanternfly moving onto a maple tree. And literally thousands of lanternflies can accumulate on one tree and, and feed very heavily. But uh, to date, lanternfly feeding does not kill fruit trees or ornamentals. So even with high numbers, as horrifying as that might look to you, uh, based on reports, but also based on um, physiological studies where researchers have um, confined lanternfly on grapes and on ornamentals and kind of uh, required that, you know, made them feed, the physiological response is such that uh, it's, it's can be, you know, very damaging to grape, but ornamental, various ornamental trees, it's, it's more of a stressor. And in terms of forestry and impacts on timber, uh, to date, we have no evidence that lanternfly penetrates into forests. It likes disturbed habitats, so it typically feeds on edges, and so we're not seeing an impact of forestry. 
And so what, what is it doing? Well, certainly it's getting into things. And so nurseries and um, have to keep it out of any shipments, any life stages, even dead lantern fly, that's not good for your reputation to, to ship that around. And so you can see here, one of the only, you know, uh, sets of, of plants that lanternflies don't feed upon are conifers, but that doesn't mean that they can't get into them. And so there's costs associated with managing and trying to keep lanternfly out of these shipments, certainly um, keeping eggs off of nursery stock uh, is problematic. This has been somewhat of a problem for the Christmas tree industry. You can see it's almost impossible to see egg masses and inspect um, thoroughly there but they're, they are managing uh, pretty well in terms of changing their um, shipping strategies in the case of nurseries so that they move nursery stock and pull it in, in uh, early in the day or later in the day when lanternfly is, is less active. And so as I showed you, we have uh, a quarantines under, under these various areas. And so there's um, a, a permitting system uh, where any industry or any anyone driving through uh, a spotted lanternfly quarantine zone is required to do some online training that Penn State provides, get a permit, and uh, be compliant because you are not, um, you must not move any life stage of lanternfly in your goods or actually on your conveyance. And so this is, you know, potentially a, a important for timber trees that they want to make sure that they can't don't move egg messes on logs and also on tree fruit even on the the crates um, in that case uh, and so again it there's economic impacts in terms of management but again not as bad as we thought from direct feeding and so I keep saying feeding to date right and so lanternfly, because it moves around so much, what it feeds on is relative to what's in a given area. So even though we haven't seen it uh, damage some various you know, other specialty crops, um, if that's all that's around, does it mean that it won't? And so we're keeping on guard. And so some of the work that, that we're doing in my lab is essentially um, force feeding lanternfly on various other specialty crops. And so if it's going to be, uh, if, if a, a crop is going to be at risk, that means that lanternfly, um, uh, if it feeds, if that's all it has to feed on, it should be able to survive. And so can lanternfly survive when it's confined to just one of these crops? And if it feeds on these crops, what is the damage? And so we've been studying a variety of different um, specialty crops over the last several years. And I wanna mention just some findings with, uh, with hops. And so here again, this is a worst case scenario. We had control hops that we didn't confine any lanternfly on. And here we had um, 100 lanternfly confined to these hops. And, and if lanternfly would die, we'd, we'd pack more back in to maintain this constant pressure uh, for two weeks of 100 lanternflies feeding on hops. And lanternflies did survive well. And you can see uh, the, the hops didn't fare so well. We had brown and shriveled cones, you know, dead leaves and vine necrosis. And so we repeated that study this year. And this was work led by my postdoc, Holly Shugert, who unfortunately um, is, is uh, came down with a cold and is not able to present these results to you today. Um, but basically we um, wanted to re redo the study this year with nymph, nymphal uh, lanternfly. And uh, looking at these vines, we replace them, and, and I'll come back to that. And so here, this is these are data from this year. Looking at nymphal survival, it's really, really good. Even when you're packing in 50 or 100 lanternflies um, onto a, a hops plant, um, they're able to survive really well. And compared to uh, the other things, basically this is the survivorship uh, over time. Of, of lanternfly on hops, as well as on strawberry, blueberry, pumpkin, tomato, and sunflower. And uh, basically the star triangle and, and plus signs show when lanternfly molted into the nice next life stage. And so uh, survivorship was really great on hops and they seem to develop the fastest uh, on hops compared to these other crops. And so we're going to do um, work here starting next week on, on adults, uh, you know, to get more data for this. But what was interesting is that I, I mentioned that uh, we had to put in new hops 
um, because you know we thought we really destroyed the ones last year from these studies. And so here in the foreground are the new hops that were put in that the nymphal data was found on. But in the background here, these are the hops that we used last year. And basically you can't tell the difference between those that were damaged you know, with our uh, heavy lanternfly feeding at, at high densities of 100 per vine um, versus not at all. So we were really pleased to see that, um, we call these the unkillable hops, that hops seem to be really resilient, which is good news. But again, we're working on this more. And so lanternfly life cycle here in Eastern Pennsylvania, um, early instars start to hatch in end of April, beginning of May. And they, they go through a series of three nymphal instars. And this is when they feed on a whole range of herbaceous plants. As fourth instars in June, they tend to move on to woodier tissues and feed through uh, tree trunks and, and uh, branches. And then um, here, uh, you know, at the beginning of September, this is when we see lanternfly start to mate and lay eggs. And we see them move into new areas and fly to feed heavily. And so, you know, basically, how do we manage spotted lanternfly? Well, the management kind of focuses on where you are in the life cycle. And so I, I want to mention we have a management guide for landscape professionals on the Penn State Extension site. Uh, that's probably the, the best resource I've seen because it, it takes a, a decision tree approach to how to think about treating lanternfly. And we emphasize to folks, you cannot keep lanternfly off any one property. They feed very broadly, and so is nymphs. Uh, they feed only short periods of time on herbaceous plants and then move around. And so, again, rather than trying to keep them out entirely, monitor your high value plants. And if you're going to treat, really only treat those. And here again, these are, you know, this, these are some of the preferred host plants across the life cycle for spotted lanternfly. And then again, these are management options based on time of year. And I want to mention that um, while while these are effective, there's no one silver bullet. And so um, since lanternfly is in the egg stage for the majority of the year, right? You can see um, uh, eggs are laid in September, October, and they don't hatch out till May. So that's a good long period of time to potentially um, attack the eggs and, and scrape them or spray them with oils. But I do wanna mention that uh, again, there's no one silver bullet. This is a study that, that folks did um, that I had the opportunity to be involved with. And basically here, these were uh, tree of heaven trees that were felled and, and lanternfly egg masses were counted. And what we found was that uh, the majority, the vast majority of egg masses were laid over six meters above the ground. So really out of, out of um, reach uh, for, for scraping or spraying. So again, scrape what you can get to and treat what you can get to. Uh, but again, just attacking egg masses isn't really sufficient. And so I wanna talk about some of the work we're doing uh, and new discoveries we're making um, with, with egg laying. And so you can see egg laying uh, is about to start uh, right now. And so just to give you a sense of what, uh, what we're up against with lanternfly, there's a study that uh, colleagues of mine uh, led by Dennis Calvin and John Rost did where this is, um, there's, this is a subdivision uh, outside of Reading, Pennsylvania. And these red dots are trees, the red maple trees that were all planted at the same time when this development was established. And so what they did is they put sticky band traps on these trees for two consecutive seasons and essentially um, counted lanternfly uh, that were trapped out on these trees over the course of the season. And as they were adults, um, adults were collected into ethanol for me to examine. And so uh, basically what we found is that um, early in the season when they put you know, sticky bands around um, trees such that any lanternfly moving up the tree would be stuck and captured on these sticky bands, what you can see is that um, they started with kind of an, a pretty high number, I think 475 lanternfly per tree. And then you see with sticky bands, again, removing those lanternfly and trapping them out every week, we see a drop in the population. So that starts to look like, hey, lanternfly, you know, trapping out is, is working here. But then we see adults migrated in. 
And so uh, you see there's 615 lanternfly on average. And then in terms of, okay, lanternfly egg masses, you know, how many eggs were laid and, and um, how many egg masses were laid. And, and based on estimates of, uh, you know, 37 eggs on average um, per egg mass, what that relates to here then is a lot more eggs being laid. And so you see, I had to go back to this previous slide, 615 adults, boom. When you talk about eggs, that population really, really grew with the adults that moved in and laid their eggs in mass. And so uh, this is the problem with lanternfly. Uh, they, these populations fluctuate as associated with the insect movement. And so they really moved in from the surrounding woodlot. And so uh, trying to manage um, areas, especially when there's different land ownership is, is really what we're up against with lanternfly. This is very, very challenging. And so why does it move in the late season? And, and it moves in the late season to complete its reproductive development. And what this is showing you is um, counts of lanternfly per vine in impacted vineyards. And so you can see you know, that you get this spike uh, as lanternfly um, starts to reproductively mature. And so I've taken live weights. Yes, at this time of year, um, lantern flies feed very, very heavily. Their mass increases. And so uh, this uh, basically is reflected in, in actually looking at them. You can see um, one thing that I've been doing is measuring this exposed lateral area of their abdomen because as they fatten up, that area expands. Uh, that area of yellow is correlated with their mass. And, and so basically what we're doing in my lab is we're measuring this area and I'm doing dissections to look to see if they've been mated and to characterize how reproductively mature uh, the females are. And so the idea here was to come up with a growing degree, growing degree day model to predict when lantern flies would be reproductively mature and just, you know, based on what is my, my base threshold. And so I uh, basically am looking at the adults that were collected off of those red maple trees on those two consecutive years. And so here, these are the um, females and the yellow, uh, the height of the yellow bar is the area of that um, yellow abdomen. And you can see they fatten up. And where I see the first mating um, was kind of early on in the year. And at that point, 40% of the sample was already mated. And then very shortly thereafter, um, more lantern fly, uh, the majority of the lanternfly were mated. At that time was when I saw the presence of mature eggs. And again, it happened very, very quickly um, in this time period. They went from you know, not seeing any mature eggs to um, within two weeks seeing most having mature eggs. And so I want to point out, uh, contrary to a, a preliminary, uh, another publication that suggested spotted lanternfly um, can't fly when they're very heavy, uh, that's not true, they're moving in. And so SLF are likely to be mated and gravid when they're moving into these new areas. So we need to be cautious here. And this is consistent, my dissections are consistent with when the first egg masses were observed you know, at the end of September in um, 2019. And so, 2020 data, this is kind of interesting uh, because the first egg masses were reported at that same site, uh, 28th of September, so about the same time, but 2020 was much, much cooler. And so thinking about this in terms of growing degree days, uh, this is uh, this insect is, is always throwing us um, things. So, so basically in 2020, that was a much cooler year. And uh, at, at the time of you know, when the first egg mass was observed, almost, it was almost 250 degree days, um, fewer had accumulated in 2020 compared to 2015. And so, you know, you know, we would expect that development uh, might be a little bit slower for lanternfly in, in this cooler year. And so it could be the case, you know, it's even though it's cooler, egg laying kind of started at about the same time. So it could be the case that um, day length uh, or some other cue might be initiating um, actual egg laying, but still uh, if development is driven by degree days and temperature, then we would think development. And in, in this study, my proxy for development is that size of the, you know, the yellow area on the abdomen. We would think that that development would lag 
in 2020 because it was a cooler year relative to 2019. And so looking at those yellow area measurements, and this is kind of new hot off the press data that I'm currently working on, but the uh, these bars show, and again, the uh, samples were collected uh, a little bit earlier than in 2019. And so this is showing the, the yellow area of those females in 2020. And again, we would predict when we overlay the 2019 data, we would expect that their development should be a little bit slower here in these yellow bars in 2020 compared to 2019, but that's really not what we see at all. Uh, the yellow bars show the development in 2019 and compared to 2020. And what we see is that no uh, development isn't slower in the cooler year. It's actually pushed up a bit. They developed a little bit faster in this cooler year. So this is something that's a, a, kind of problematic. You know, are they getting Certainly uh, degree days are important, but they're not the whole story. And so are, are these insects able to, you know, are they queuing in on some other um, variables, you know, in, in the host plant uh, that allow them to kind of compensate um, and, and feed as they need to. So again, this is work that we're continuing to, to work on right now. Um, and I want to mention in terms of this movement into vineyards, even though we don't have these great degree day models, that doesn't mean that we don't know that they move in. And so presently we're testing things like exclusion netting and insecticide treating netted, treated netting. And uh, this, this particular vineyard where we saw really high numbers and where there was damage, uh, the population varied last year. Uh, so um, it's, again, it, things are very quite variable with lanternfly. You might have high population some year and you see it dropping off. This study is continues to go on this year. And, um, uh, but we're, we're working on coming up with, with whatever we can. And so here I do wanna mention in terms of this variation across years, um, these, this is a particular um, type of trap that I'll show you about. And in 2019, we saw really high numbers of lanternfly coming into and being killed by these traps. And we see that the numbers dropped off in subsequent years. And so we're continuing to do trapping studies um, at the same sites for subsequent years. But what we know is that um, lanternfly populations do die out. They still might pop back. That's something we're working on now. Um, but in terms of innovation, uh, this pole trap is something where, uh, that is uh, kind of trying to think outside the box with lanternfly. And essentially this is a, a, a tall pole, like a telephone pole or a utility pole that has Delta methrin impregnated netting um, uh, laid over it. And uh, a cap was designed, this is work led by Brian Walsh uh, at, here at Penn State and working with uh, agricultural engineering, they came up with a, a design to clamp um, this netting onto po poles. And so basically lanternfly flying into the poles, this takes advantage of the fact that lanternfly, when they land on something, they will move up and they seem to be potentially attracted to taller structures. And so uh, lanternfly uh, get exposed to the insecticide through their tarsi and perhaps as their abdomen drags along this netting. And then you can see below our lanternfly caught dead uh, on tarps and, and they were caught on tarps to be to be counted. And so the idea is that maybe these poles could be useful for monitoring, uh, also maybe even as traps to kill. And, and uh, no plant hopper has been known to use any kind of pheromones or chemical signals. So we don't have a good lure. So we're left with trying to be innovative in these kind of um, dimensions. And Brian has worked with the utility company and has installed this delta methrin impregnated netting around ports around the Philadelphia area. He's designed a catch basin to catch the dead lanternfly. And so uh, this is outside of the port of Philadelphia. And so these poles are being tested as we speak this year. Uh, the problem is that the company Vestergaard that sells this insecticide treated netting uh, has taken this um, netting off the market in the United States. And so Brian is trying to test alternative products. But again, um, we'll, we'll see how these do this year with, with the netting that he does have. Along the lines of other innovation, I just have a couple of minutes here. Uh, sooty mold, I did wanna mention that when lanternfly excretes honeydew onto plants, uh, that's a substrate for sooty mold growth. These fungi feed on those sugars and 
can blacken uh, the understory plants beneath lanternfly. And so uh, one of the things that we've been looking at in my lab is trying to understand what is soot, what is lanternfly sooty mold. And so to do that, my student uh, who just graduated, Dr. Now Dr. Mariam Taleb, uh, we swab the surfaces of, of plant leaves um, that were hit with spotted lanternfly honeydew and we used uh, next generation DNA sequencing, kind of like characterizing the human microbiome, that same kind of approach using amplicon sequencing to characterize these fungi that grow as sooty mold develops. And she also validated this with standard light and SEM microscopy. And what we found was that lanternfly sooty mold was um, seemed to be this trichomerium. It was a highly abundant, uh, highly abundant in the DNA sequences. And any sooty mold samples she found um, on various host plants under lanternfly um, all had trichomerium present. And so here, trichomerium is characterized by these really interesting star-like uh, structures. Uh, and here they're kind of colorized in red in this SEM. And so we we're hoping uh, that this could be used as a candidate for monitoring. Um, if you don't know if you have lanternfly, look to see if you have trichomerium present on trees. And finally, I'll end here with some work um, that takes advantage of the mouth parts of spotted lanternfly. You can see the mouth parts are there. And if you break off uh, that um, chitin, that exoskeleton, you see there's two thin stylets that the insects insert into plant tissues. And so working in collaboration with folks there in New Zealand, Manahari Sandanaka and uh, Jackie Todd with Elaine Backus from USDA, you can take advantage of, of this feeding penetration. And here you see a gold wire is glued onto lantern fly. And if you insert um, a probe into the, into the plant and essentially run an electric current, as the lanternfly feeds and its mouth parts penetrate the plant tissue, uh, you get an electric signal that can be read, you get these spikes. And so here's the setup. And so here, what we're doing is we're recording lanternfly feeding behavior. And what we see and what Holly sees are patterns of these spikes. And if she correlates that with um, histology on the plant tissue segments, um, you can see when lanternfly is salivating, when it's probing, if it's penetrating uh, xylem cells or phloem cells and, and whatnot. And so the idea is that in, in the context of grapes, um, if we test different varieties and find some that lanternfly have uh, a harder time feeding on relative to other varieties, uh, basically this could inform potential um, breeding, uh, selecting for plant varieties that might be more resistant to lanternfly feeding. And so with that, I'm ending, I'm at my 40 minutes. I do wanna mention that these are just some of the innovative approaches we're taking. Uh, there's not gonna be any silver bullet, but there's many tools in development and I'm leading a, a large regional grant. Our website is stopslf.org. Uh, other collaborators are working on classical biological control. So I welcome you to look at that a website for the latest, greatest research on what we're finding with Lanternfly. And thank you very much. And I look forward to talking with you in person. Hi, Julie. Good morning um, or good evening, wherever you are. And um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, fantastic to see all of the work that you've been doing in the United States um, and lots of things that we can learn from in New Zealand. So we don't necessarily have to duplicate the research. Um, we do have Julie live for some time to um, have a question and answer session. Um, does anyone have a question? Kia ora, Robin from Zespri here. I'm fortunate enough to have been on the Slido machine here and I've got about six goodies, but we're gonna bounce to and from the floor. The first one here is, so Julie, in kiwi fruit, honeydew results in sooty mold as well. It's Great to hear plant death isn't widespread for all hosts, but how concerned should we be about honeydew? That's that's a definitely a great question. Uh, to date, well, I want to mention that in, in some of the work that we're doing in collaboration with um, uh, Mano and, and Jackie, we are looking at uh, impacts on uh, kiwi fruit in our lab. And so, and that will include sooty mold as well. Um, we, uh, they seem, the, the, the bad side so far is that they really seem to like it and they seem to survive pretty well on, on kiwi fruit in the lab. Um, but sooty mold, it's kind of challenging because 
based on reports from spotted lanternfly damage in uh, South Korea, they reported biggest impacts on grapes and also a lot of that damage was from sooty mold growth. Uh, and while we do see some sooty molded vineyards here and have some reports from growers, it is not blocking photosynthesis. It is not problematic here. I don't know if it's a dif differential use of fungicides or if it's a function of the different um, varieties of, of grapes in this case. And so uh, in, in the study that my student did, we did the microbiome work on cultivated versus wild grape vines and saw, uh, uh, like, while trichomerium was present in both, there was less trichomerium present in the cultivated grapes. So there is something different um, about cultivated grapes uh, in terms of how, you know, what molds will grow on them. And so it, it is hard to say off the top without any data how concerned you should be about sooty mold, but I'm concerned enough for us to be looking at it. Thanks, Julie. My name is Barry O'Neill. Great presentation. Do you know if anyone's looking at um, SIT, sterile male technology? Um, um, I'm, and can you just give us a little bit more update on some of the biological type uh, predator work that might be looked at, being looked at? Thank you. Yep, great, great questions. Thank you. So the, there has been interest in taking that sterile male approach, but, but the problem here uh, and, and the huge limitation um, and, and why I think nobody's really uh, taking it on is because uh, at this point it is incredibly impractical to, and, and I don't know, we don't have means yet possible to rear lantern fly in the numbers we would need to do mass release. And so a slide that I didn't show you um, is, uh, making comparisons in, in terms of that yellow area of the abdomen that I'm studying. Um, I have data that compares wild populations of lanternfly to those reared in labs. So for example, Tracy Lesky's group, uh, her postdoc, Laura Nixon, has a paper where she reared lanternfly in captivity on different hosts, you know, alone and in combination. And um, there were some hosts that were better and, and I did the dissections for any females that, um, basically any female adults that, that uh, were produced in those studies. And of the females that were produced that I was able to dissect, only one had any eggs and she only had three eggs. And so, and so there's barely any yellow exposed. It's very hard to feed the beast enough to really a rear lantern fly um, in a lab captive setting, even in a semi-captive you know setting that looks anywhere um, near as robust and as fit as wild populations. And so um, Miriam Cooperband is uh, one of the scientists at USDA APHIS, and she's on the large grant that I got. and. She was exactly trying to um, rent land to try to do um, mass rearings, and she she decided that it just wasn't feasible and is no longer doing it. Um, in terms of other biological control, uh, USDA um, uh, folks, Kim Holmer, and uh, who's at a USDA ARS facility in Newark, New Jersey, and Julie Gould, who's USDA APHIS in Massachusetts, they uh, were also called uh, to be part of the technical working group in 2014 when Lanterfly was first detected. And they immediately began explorations uh, in for natural enemies in Lanternfly's native range. So they went to China and they brought back um, two parasitoid wasps. Uh, one is Anastatus orientalis and it's an egg parasitoid. And so uh, they have it in their highly quarantined facilities here, and they've been working on it ever since. And the first problem that they found was that the, the timing of the life cycle of the anastatus did not match that of lanternfly. And with further investigation and further collections, they found that they actually had three different, they wouldn't call, they don't call them subspecies, just biotypes 
um, of of this Anastatus wasp. And it took like a number of years for them to do the DNA sequencing to kind of characterize that. So now they have identified one of the subtypes whose phenology does match that of lanternfly. And they've, um, they're looking at now host specificity testing to make sure it, it you know, will it, will it target um, eggs that are not lanternfly eggs and, and hit some native insects. And so to date, they've only done that in lab studies, and they're looking to do that more realistically in like semi-field studies. Um, so that is promising, but it just takes a long time for that work. The, the other um, parasitoid that they brought back is Dryanus. I think the species is Sinica. And so this is a nymphal parasitoid. So it lays its eggs in nymphal lanternfly and eats them from the inside out. And so they have that um, being reared well in captivity. And so that's kind of interesting. That's promising. Um, just uh, studying plant hoppers and collecting them for as long as I have, it's it's uh, these dryanid parasit parasitoids tend to be, you know, co tend to commonly attack plant hoppers. So I'm kind of rooting for that one. So that's very promising. Um, also, Anne Hayek at Cornell University and, and her former postdoc, Eric Clifton, uh, are looking at fungal pathogens. And you might have seen they um, described a new uh, species of, of fungus that attacked lanternfly a number of years ago. But that was a very, very localized um, occurrence of that pathogen. We haven't really seen it since. And so they're on the lookout looking for other fungi. So that's a little less promising, but they're still working on it. And, and those are really, yeah, those are the major um, uh, approaches for biological control or more sustainable control of lanternfly at this point. Cool. Thank you for that, Julie. We yep. haven't got a hell of a lot of time left to answer too many questions, but I've got a couple of goodies here, and I'll try and combine a few to appease a few people in the audience. So if spotted lanternfly is not a good flyer, how often do adults spread from one region to the next? The second part of this question is, or are the egg masses the culprit for spreading via plant materials? So if that's the case, how robust are their eggs, and could they survive a journey to New Zealand on the outside of a shipping container? Big question, I, sorry. The, the last question, yes. Yes, I think they could. Um, and, and I mean, they 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 got here from China, right, or from Asia. And so I think they are very robust in terms of, I don't know the exact environmental conditions of a shipping container, so it's kind of hard to speak to that. But yes, the eggs are very robust. But the other issue is that, especially because they're so mobile at this time of year, they get into trucks, they get into cars, they get in, they could potentially get into planes, they've gotten onto ships. And so they're really active when the females are most likely mated. And I've dissected plenty of females with multiple spermatophores. So they're mating with, you know, maybe not all the time, but often more than one male. And so, and we know females can lay more than one egg case. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly how many, but two to three is what Tracy Lesky has seen in, in her insects. And so I, I think that um, in within the U.S., when they get into cars and get into trains and trucks and they move, those rail lines and roadways are paved with tree of heaven. So they have a constant food source for when they pop out. Um, I think they'd be most likely to get to you by egg mass, but again, um, it, it's 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 these multiple factors that contribute to their movement, not just in the egg mass that make them a problem. Does that answer your question? I think we got there. So that was the last one. Thank you, Julie. We may follow up with a few other questions that people had, but in the meantime, I'll pass back to Leanne. Thank you much, uh, very much for joining us, Julie. Um, very informative um, presentation, and thank you for staying to answer questions um, for us. I'm sure we'll be in touch with you in the future um, as we progress um, our readiness work in Spotted Lanternfly. So our next presenter is Erin Lane, who's the Biosecurity Advisor from KVH. 
Erin works with both growers and the wider kiwi fruit industry to bring awareness of biosecurity threats to manage our biosecurity risks as they arise. So Erin will be talking about work underway to prepare the New Zealand kiwi fruit industry for spotted lanternfly if it arrives. Thanks, Erin. Perfect. Um, yeah, so Julie gave us a great um, introduction of spotted lanternfly, some of its biologies, and what it's doing um, overseas in the US. So I'm going to look to bring it down a little bit and focus specifically on spotted lanternfly and what we know in kiwi fruit and what we're doing um, as an industry to ready ourselves for it. So what we did is we looked at some of that Chinese um, language literature to see um, what the impacts of spotted lanternfly were over there. We found that when we looked at English literature, um, there wasn't a whole lot of information, and that's because spotted lanternfly hasn't really spread outside of its Asian native range into areas that grow kiwi fruit. Um, so we looked at the Chinese um, space, and we found um, in some of these reports that they were saying 20 to 30% damage, um, and on these really severely infested orchards, we were getting up to 50%. Um, I do want to caveat that with, um, as Julie mentioned, that this damage, we're not necessarily sure how that relates to fruit loss or productivity, um, but the numbers are high enough to trigger our concern and, and get us thinking about what we need to do. We know that Hayward and Gold varieties are impacted, and we know that both the nymphs and the adults cause damage by sucking the leaves and canes, um, as well as that sooty mould um, production on that honeydew that the adults produce. The nymphs are most damaging during the kiwi fruit growth period, so they come out of those overwintering egg masses as it heats up in spring. Um, they cluster on the underside of leaves and on the young canes, um, and they can result in leaf deformation and killing those young canes. So you can imagine that as you're trying to grow good canes and good leaves to grow good kiwi fruit later in the season, if you're getting impacted here, then the flow-on effects um, for the rest of the season could be significant. Um, peak damage for adults is in that Feb-March stage when we have fruit on our vines and when that sooty mould be could become a real problem. So I guess in summary for impact, we know that it appears early. Um, as soon as um, spring comes, we start seeing spotted lanternfly, really high densities, um, and it has a really long damage period. So pretty much from spring through to you know March, six months of the year, you could be getting damage from spotted lanternfly on your vines. Um, as part of understanding what our risk is, we need to understand what the likelihood of entry is. Um, and I'll touch a little bit on that question that Robin asked about sea containers coming in. Um, so MPI did a really extensive pest risk analysis for us that looked at all the life stages of spotted lanternfly um, and the likelihood of them getting in on all the pathways that come into New Zealand. Um, from this, we found, um, not surprising, that it's those overwintering egg masses that are the highest risk. Um, and as Julie mentioned, they have that waxy layer that makes them hard to manage at our borders. They're hard to fumigate, but it also camouflages them quite well. So when they're um, on pallets or on other flat surfaces like sea containers, they can be quite hard to see. Um, we know that sea containers, so inanimate pathways, are sea containers, forest pro products like um, pallets or timber and personal effects, um, which are really those ones that sit outdoors for a long time, barbecues, outdoor furniture, outdoor chairs that have the ability for spotted lanternfly to lay their eggs, those are the highest risk pathways. Um, but what we did, or what MPI did look at, is that the likelihood of actually getting viable unhatched eggs coming into New Zealand um, is considered pretty low, and that's because temperature is what dictates when eggs hatch. So as goods come from the northern hemisphere down um, into our summer, those temperatures that will be found on vessels and in sea containers um, are likely high enough to cause those eggs to hatch on journey. And then we know that nymphs don't really last any longer than five days, and adults don't last longer than three days without food. And so the chances of finding food um, for a spotted lanternfly on a vessel or in a sea container are pretty small. So um, while we get these eggs, they'll likely hatch on way, and then the nymphs that come out of them um, will likely die before, before they get here. And um, that top point, we actually haven't had any live interceptions of spotted lanternfly at our border to date, so that probably is a good indication currently of where that risk sits. 
Um, also, as part of that pest risk analysis, just really quickly, they looked at establishment and spread, um, and they found that the climate in New Zealand um, matches really similar to the climate where spotted lanternflies found offshore. Um, if you look at that map, you'll see that those warmer colours, the reds and the oranges, are where the climate is um, most similar in New Zealand to what we see offshore. And I think if you overlaid that with our kiwi fruit growing regions, you would probably see that they fall within all those areas. So climate is unlikely to be um, a hindrance for it establishing here. Julie mentioned it's got a really broad host range, so it will be able to find food really quickly. They produce large numbers of eggs. And we don't have that surveillance system like we have for some of our other main pests. So for BMSB and fruit fly, we're lucky that we have these lures that we're able to put a surveillance system out and attract them. Unfortunately, we don't have that for spotted lantern fly. So the chances of um, detecting it early, um, it's harder anyway. And spread, um, considered high, not strong flies naturally. You know, 40 metres in a jump, they can kind of get on their own. But as we saw in the US, it's that human-mediated spread. So they jump on a car, they jump on um, some containers that have been moved around New Zealand, and then they, they make their way down the country pretty easily. So movement controls would be really important. So what have we done to date? I mentioned the Chinese literature. Um, we've also done an extensive literature review ourselves, looking at the biology, the distribution, impacts and management, and those two pieces were really just primarily trying to um, give us an indication of how worried we should be about spotted lanternfly to know how much focus we should put into it in the future. And from those, we found that, um, as I mentioned, the impacts can be quite significant. So that kind of kicked off our first project that Chandon mentioned really briefly, which is that spotted lanternfly work in China. And that's really looking to understand the life stages, which will help us be able to um, ensure that when we time our management strategies and we use our tools, that we're using them at the right time for the right life stage. And trying to quantify those impacts I talked about a little bit more to get some harder numbers around what we're looking at. Just quickly, where are we looking to focus in the future? We've just started our research program. It's still pretty early um, in its stages, but what we're looking to do in the future, or some of the gaps we think we'd like to cover, is netting. So what would this look like in kiwi fruit? We know it's used in vineyards overseas to manage spotted lanternfly. And what's the best method? Do we do just our borders, because it doesn't necessarily fly in? It, it kind of isn't as good as BMSB at that, or do we need to do the whole orchards? And how can we align this, or potentially align this with some of our other big pests where um, netting is important, like BMSB? Get you know, more bang for our buck, if we can cover more pests at the same time, um, then that would be good. Um, secondly, what crop protection options we have in, um, our, or what, yeah, in our current crop protection standard, um, and are the rates and timings effective? We know that um, chemical controls um, quite hard to manage spotted lanternfly because it just flies out and then flies back in once you're not putting the chemicals in. Um, we know bifenthrins um, are really effective offshore treatment. Um, we have that in our crop protection standard currently for passion vine, hopper and cicada eggs in winter, I believe. So could that be effective when we're seeing those eggs in our orchards over winter as well, um, knowing that it's got that waxy coating, but having a, a better look at that to understand. And lastly, a couple more areas, looking at monitoring, how would that work um, in the orchard and surrounds? Is sticky banding an option? Um, Julie talked about some circle traps. And again, trying to align this with timing of other high-risk pests so that we can um, kind of look for a whole range of organisms at once and have a monitoring system that covers a broad range where possible. Um, egg laying preference and timing, and we're covering that a little bit in our China project. Um, and that's really about, that's the easiest life stage to manage. It's a mobile. Um, we know that they come into the orchard in spring in that growth period. So if we can reduce the population numbers in winter, that means in spring we might not be getting so many nymphs on our orchard, so the damage might not be as significant. And lastly, um, quantifying those impacts. So looking at the economics, understanding both the direct impacts to the vine, but understanding more about that sooty mould. What does that mean for our fruit? Um, you know, does it affect its marketability and is it as bad um, as some reports say in China um, or, or is it not? So wanting to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that's me. So as I mentioned, we're still really early in our, in our research kind of program for this organism, but um, we've got a few good things on the list. And if you give me another year, I can stand up here, I reckon, at next Biosecurity Day and I'll have a few um, more answers for you. But yes, that's me.
Thanks, Erin, for your overview of what KVH and Zespri are doing for spotted lanternfly readiness. Um, so a reminder that um, please submit your questions via the Slido app um, during the presentations and we'll have a Q&A session later on. So the next speaker's up, uh, Lisa Gibson, who is the Principal Communications Advisor from KVH and myself. Uh, Lisa manages the way that KVH engages with growers, post-harvest facilities, the public and key partners from within the industry. Lisa and I will talk about the notification of a biosecurity response and give you a sneak peek behind the scenes. So a biosecurity response um, starts off with a notification. So in the event of a major response, there'll be a wide range of industries involved um, and they'll each be called upon to assist. So depending on the size of the event, um, it may be um, central government, which includes Biosecurity New Zealand. If the native estate is impacted, it might include DOC as well. Local government will often be included, uh, mana whenua, the impacted industries like KVH and other industry partners in horticulture, local communities who are, are our eyes and ears on the ground and international markets. So we all work really closely together and everyone has their own responsibilities. So there are four phases to a biosecurity response. Each has a certain trigger point, but they can also run concurrently. So depending on the level of risk, um, these phases can be activated very quickly um, within hours. All phases involve the Government Industry Agreement for Biosecurity Readiness and Response, GIA, uh, like partners like KVH and other industries. So we share decision making with Biosecurity New Zealand and we also share costs under the partnership. So phase one is the potential threat is identified. Phase two is the threat is assessed and a recommendation is made to stand up a response or not. Uh, phase three, the response is activated and work gets underway to set up the response structure. And phase four is after the outcomes are met of a response, uh, the response is transitioned into a longer term arrangement whether the response has been successful and there's been eradication or moving to a different solution. So just going into a bit more detail, um, when there is uh, a potential pest detected, MPI usually gets us through the 0800 hotline uh, or their new online reporting tool. The pest is quickly sent for identification to confirm whether it's an unwanted organism to New Zealand. So a biosecurity incursion investigator will then go out and assess the threat and writes up a rapid risk analysis, which outlines the risk and who would be impacted by this unwanted organism. Biosecurity New Zealand will notify GIA partners once the um, pest in question has been identified. And the rule of thumb is this usually happens at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So we'll get uh, the notification after we've had the ID. Um, so if it's an insect pest, quite often there can be a morphological ID and we'll get notification quickly. If it's a pathogen, sometimes it takes a bit longer and we'll have to wait a bit longer to hear about it. It's at this point that an organisation like KVH will undertake our own assessment as well with the information that we have to hand and also review the rapid risk assessment that is uh, received from MPI. So based on this assessment and our assessment, I will make a recommendation to whether or not we stand up a response. So once the, uh, the joint decision is made by Biosecurity New Zealand and the industry GIA partners to activate a response, the response structure is stood up. So this includes response governance, which KVH participates in on behalf of the kiwifruit industry. Um, and we set objectives and direct the intention of outcomes. So we always aim for eradication, but sometimes, depending on the nature of the organism, it might be containment or another um, objective. Concurrently, there'll be the establishment of the response framework under the Coordinated Incident Management System, or SIMS, to carry out the response plan and on-the-ground activities. So transition usually occurs when the response outcomes are met, um, so eradication is always the aim, um, it, or if there's agreement to manage residual risk in some other way, such as long-term management. Regardless of the response outcomes, the response partners will always undertake a lessons learned exercise so that we can um, improve how we respond in the future. I'll now hand over to Lisa, who'll take you through the operational side of the response and KiwiNet's involvement.
Thank you, Leanne. Now, when a response is set up, this is a visual of the structure that's put in place. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through it at all. Um, but some of you may have seen it before, and I think there's actually a few people in the room who know it like the back of their hand. Um, as Leanne said, it's called the SIMS model, the Coordinated Incident Management System. It's used nationally, not only by biosecurity organisations. Um, Civil Defence, for example, use it, and they're using it at the moment in NAUSIM. It's New Zealand's official framework for coordinated responses. So this is a framework that will always be used. By default of being the lead agency, a lot of these positions would be filled by people from Biosecurity New Zealand, but you would find KVH team members either working within a lot of these work streams or even potentially leading them based on the skills and experience that we all have across the team. I've circled the logistics function or work stream, and that is the area that organises and implements the KiwiNet contribution into responses. KiwiNet is our industry's group of people who champion biosecurity, prepare for responses, and make sure that we can feed into them and provide resource. So what this function would do once a response is initiated and teams are set up is provide and track all the resources that will be needed for the response and they also help the other work streams. So the resources will include everything from personnel to equipment to supplies to cars to making sure there are bases and places to be working from each morning to the incredibly important things like food and where do you go and get your dinner every night. It's also this logistics function that will come to KVH seeking resource, and they'll also go to any other appropriate type of organisation that might be able to help. So in the most recent fruit fly response within our region, that was ourselves, Avocado New Zealand, and the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. To try and keep things clear, I've put or kept in yellow the response logistics function, and then everything that's in the clear box is KVH. So what happens is a response is initiated, run by the lead agency, most often by Security New Zealand, with GIA signatories like Leanne mentioned, KVH. KVH slash Lisa sitting at her desk taking a deep breath will start to notify KiwiNet and say, hey, there's a response underway. Normally that would be by email because time is going to be of the essence and if anyone was at the Biosecurity Capital Symposium just the other day, we had a really stark reminder of that when there was a big discussion about foot and mouth disease and planning for that. This stuff could happen literally within hours. So what I would be doing is getting ready to contact everybody and say, there's going to be more details coming soon. Please start to think about how you can potentially contribute to a response. The response logistics team will then let me know exactly what's required. So that would be something really specific, like we need 17 people in Auckland for the next six weeks. We want everybody to work for at least 14 days, and we want them to be in Auckland from tomorrow morning. That is when I will then come to KiwiNet and say, we need specific resources. These are the types of skills and attributes and experience that we would want from people who are going to be taking part. And of course, KiwiNet members are all going to put their hands up and say, yes, absolutely, I'm available, I would love to take part. The logistics team will sort everything out, their travel, accommodation, and they'll welcome you with open arms and KVH will be there in the background, continuing to support, provide help, provide training, providing resources, and always just being a phone call away. In fact, there may even be some of us that are there with you. I've put here a couple of photos from, like I said, our most recent KiwiNet contribution to a response, which was the fruit fly incursion. As an industry, we provided almost 700 people hours, and I think there was 54 people in total that made up all of those hours. We took part in everything from fruit collection and inspection to door knocking, leaflet dropping, and taking part in community education events um, at high profile risk areas like the Otada fruit and veggie markets, and at high points of interest between different areas and restricted zones like the Devonport Ferry Terminal and supermarkets. 
As I mentioned, we do have lots and lots of resources available to help Kiwi Met members um, throughout the process of getting ready for a response, being on a response, and then afterwards as well. We've got loads of information about the really technical things like reimbursement too, because we all want to know that we're going to be well looked after while we're away. Um, specifically, we have lots of information about how an employer of staff who are deployed on a response are reimbursed for the time that their staff take, and how as an individual, if you do have to do things like buy extra data for your cell phone while you're away, maybe get extra meals, how those types of things are all reimbursed as well. Um, on the right hand side there, if you're interested, when we did finish the fruit fly response, I did some interviews with about eight people who had taken part, just to hear from them and get some first hand accounts about what they enjoyed, what they learnt, so that if there is ever anybody who's potentially looking at raising their hand and taking part in a response, especially for the first time but feeling a wee bit nervous about it, not sure what to anticipate, um, we've got a whole lot of resources and first hand accounts on the website as well from people who did recently take part and really enjoyed it. Thank you. Have you got the... Oh, here. Cool. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I do know that we're running a little bit behind time, um, but we will make it up. Um, so our next speaker is Janika Rita, who's a biosecurity advisor from KVH. Janneke works closely with Erin to bring awareness and develop new and innovative ways to increase uptake and awareness of biosecurity practices through outreach and through research. Uh, this involves global monitoring and scanning for emerging risks and threats to the kiwi fruit industry offshore. Janneke will be speaking about how we're preparing alongside other industry sectors for invasive moths and butterflies. Thank you, Leanne. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be chatting to you all today about things with wings or unwanted moths and butterflies. So, um, moths and butterflies sit under the group uh, Lepidoptera, which is a huge group. Um, it's one of the most well known insect orders in the world. There are over 157 thousand um, species worldwide and they can be broken up into generalized two groups um, army worms which feed on crops and also lamantras which feed on trees and there are many that impact horticulture but I have a few examples down the bottom there uh, the grape um, vine leaf rolling moth is an emerging pest of kiwi fruit crops and vineyards over in Chile for example and also the omnivorous leaf roller California is seeing some impacts of this guy on kiwi fruit. They're seeing yield losses of up to 50%. And then the fall army worm, which um, may ring a bell, a recent incursion in New Zealand, and luckily for kiwi fruit, a near miss for us. Uh, this can be, be wind dispersed, and it's actually thought to have been blown over from Australia. So how do they impact horticulture? Well, severely. Uh, larvae and caterpillars in particular um, are a huge problem for vegetation, and they can be a big biosecurity risk to forestry, horticulture, pastoral and cropping industries, as well as public impacts. There have been known to be impacts on human health from some species, well-being, natural environments, urban parks, gardens, and the like. And most of them have host preferences, but what makes them quite scary is that once they run out of a food source, they'll just move on to something else uh, if it runs out. And one of these in particular, the spongy moth, which was formerly known as the Asian gypsy moth, is considered one of the world's most destructive invasive species. And you can see on the photo on your far right, impacts on defoliation and forest in the US. So how do some impact kiwi fruit? There's one in particular, the fruit piercing moth, uh, which is a pest of ripening fruits. It's a significant economic pest. Uh, we don't have it in New Zealand, but it's known to affect over 40 different species. And it's kind of risk of entry can be in fresh produce, through the larvae and the fruit, and it can also be wind dispersed as well. Another example is the yellow peach grub moth, feeds on lots of different types of fruit, but in kiwi fruit, it also feeds on the leaves and the stems of the plant, and it can leave sugary excretions, which Julie kind of touched on, that sooty mold on the plant itself. And it's a big pest in China. 
And this, how this guy will enter usually is by fruit as well, which is a high risk pathway. So although these threats seem pretty impending and scary, we're not alone. And we're not alone because under the GIA, which is the Government Industry Agreement, there's a coalition of industries who would be impacted by Lepidoptera or things with wings. And we pool our resources and our knowledge together and work together to fight a common enemy, essentially. And we work to do this through biosecurity readiness planning, uh, response activities, cost sharing and decision making, as Leanne mentioned before. So again, we're pooling our resources to achieve a common goal to keep high-risk moths and butterflies out of New Zealand. And some examples in the Lepidoptera group, specifically you'll see New Zealand wine are there, um, avocado New Zealand, New Zealand apples and pears, just to name a few. And a recent incursion that you may have heard of um, is the fall armyworm, which has been detected in New Zealand in some regions in the North Island, the Waikato and the Taranaki and Auckland regions. I will emphasise kiwi fruit is not a known host, so it is uh, luckily a near miss for us. And there are over 360 known host plants. And they are wind dispersed, as I mentioned before, and a quick fun fact, they can travel in 24 hours up to 400 kilometres, which is a huge distance. And the main industries that they impact are maize, corn, sorghums, pasture grasses and rice. And KVH continues to be an observer in this response and in these further detections. So what's been done? Uh, these two small little documents that I'm not expecting you to be able to read um, have involved a huge amount of work and they offer an insight into how this GIA partnership has come together to pull knowledge and understanding of the many species in this order. And this readiness stock take, the white document on the right, was developed and finalised in 2021, and it really helps us highlight key information gaps we don't know about information that we need to research further. So everything kind of stacked into one place that we can call upon should we need it. And on the left is the draft strategy, the Lepidopter draft strategy, which helps um, keep the partnership, capture its vision and its purpose and its goals throughout the process of um, being ready. And the reasons why these were developed were simply obvious. We needed um, better surveillance programs for earlier detection. We have new science and technology that needed to be leveraged. Uh, approaches used in previous responses may not be applicable now in terms of um, socially or politically acceptable. And um, we also really needed to up our ante on detecting um, these, the many pests. So what's in the process? What's still to be done? The first one is kind of cost share options. So who pays for what and how much does everyone pay between industry, government and other sectors? The next one is how will we address priority work areas and what order so that work plan development? How and when will we do work and research? And the last one is more readiness work at a generic and broader level. So it's important for Lepidoptera as I mentioned because there's so many thousands of species in the group. So what can you do? Um, fortunately, now there are so many different ways that you can report the unusual if you think you see something that you're not quite sure about. There's options for it to be done on the phone. We can call Biosecurity New Zealand. You can also call KVH. Uh, if you've seen signs of disease on your vines, you can also reach out to us through KVH um, email down the bottom and phone number as well. And also, um, as Lisa mentioned before, there's the new uh, tool online for online reporting of something that you're not quite sure about. So many options to keep looking out for things with wings. Thank you. Thanks Janneke for your overview of what work is being done under the GIA Lepidoptera working group um, for keeping invasive moths and species out of New Zealand. So now we'll go to um, a short question and answer um, period with um, the Zespri Global Extension team, uh, Robin and Sophie, um, and then we'll have some morning tea. Um, we are running a bit behind, so we thought we shorten morning tea by 10 minutes, um, because when you come back, you'll be going around the demonstrations anyway. So uh, we'll just do a few um, questions for 10 minutes, and then we'll have, some, have a break. Thanks. Cool. It's only been shortened by five minutes, so you don't have to panic too much. <laughs> so we've just rejigged things a little bit. So there's going to be one question each 
for each of the presenters who we get asked to come to the front and lean on the stage, please. No, no, just lean on the edge, nice and casual. <laughs> cool. So I've got one for Chandon, and then Sophie will be taking one from the floor for Erin. So one second, please. Go back to filtered. All right. Chandon, do we know the resistance potential to serotocystis in New Zealand and or Brazilian germplasm? Um... New Zealand one we haven't really explored so far, but Brazil one we found uh, two specific ones that are really resistant to serocystis. So this is where we're going to do more work next year. We're kind of grafting those uh, New Zealand cultivars onto the resistance. So just in case there's an incursion in the future, you know, so we can try those ones as emergency stock in the future. So this is what we're doing. Awesome. Well, that was a nice quick answer. If everyone can do that, we can get through a few more. Okay, I'm going to chand in. I'm just going to give you a second one quickly then. What about insects spreading serocystis? as we see with rapid Ohio death in Hawaii. Yeah, I think uh, these are well known that yes, some insect vector can actually transmit, you know, serocystis from one to another, especially those uh, spores that it could be on the plant somewhere, and especially those xylem um, feeding um, beetles and some even fruit flies even can do it. So there's a risk still. So it has been found even not even um, only kefir, but even citrus and other, other crops as well, so it's still a risk for insect vectors. Excellent. Thank you for that. Questions for Erin? Anybody from the floor? Erin, with um, spotted lanternfly, um, has it um, spread to other places other than um, the USA? And so if, how did it get to China? You know, has it come to the Southern Hemisphere from uh, Northern Hemisphere? Um, are we aware or not? Uh, it hasn't that we're aware of. It, um, it spread out of China originally into Korea, so it did make its way um, out of Korea first, and then USA's kind of been the last invaded um, region. So it's quite new in its invasion, so that's why we look a lot over to the US to see what they're doing, because it hasn't until recently really made its way out of its native range. So, um, yeah, we're looking to see what's going, but no, no Southern Hemisphere... Um, detections yet, thankfully. Just to add to it, this one, uh, there's a few instances that's been found in Vietnam, so especially in the Southeast Asia, so yeah, so it's not really Southern Hemisphere so far other than that. Excellent. I've got one for Erin from online. So I'm going to tie a couple together to save time again here, Erin. So TOH, Tree of Heaven, mm -hmm. as a pest plant in the Bay of Plenty. Do the regional council know where all the, all of them are, and are they monitored? Is the first part. Second part is, are we going to utilise canary plants in strategic locations, like f facilities such as ports? That's a good question. Um, yeah, it is. Um, stands are known within. Um, the Bay of Plenty region. There might be individual plants on, on private properties that we don't know about, but the regional council has a good um, idea of where they are in the region. Um, they're not monitored currently for spotted lanternfly, but that is when we look at some of our monitoring programs, that's definitely um, a factor that we look at. Do we keep the tree of heaven and use it as um, almost a trap plant, I guess, or do we remove the tree of heaven um, so that it doesn't have its preferred host um, close by. We know now, originally we thought Tree of Heaven was only, was an obligate kind of host for spotted lanternfly and required um, to kind of fulfil its life cycle, and now we know that that's not true. So if we remove Tree of Heaven, um, the chances are it could likely just hop on to others. Um, as um, the canary plant is a good point, um, again, we haven't thought um, about how we could do that. We have thought about whether we could use it as a, as a canary plant, but um, I think now that it's less um, thought to be um, preferred, like there are other um, plants that are similarly preferred, that um, it's probably not going to be as of use as it was um, maybe two or three years ago when we thought Tree of Heaven was kind of its sole um, host that it, it likes. So um, things to consider when we look at our monitoring program. Um, but yeah, we are, that's our, our knowledge gap that we'll focus on going ahead. 
Do we have any questions for Leanne or Lisa? Because I do. <laughs> so Lisa, this one comes to you. How responsive were the KiwiNet members in the past when they were notified via email at 4 p.m.? Very, on a, very, on a Friday. Yeah, really, really responsive. And I was actually thinking, I knew someone would ask that, and I was trying to think last night of a really good example of how responsive people were. Very, very responsive. So grateful for it as well. Um, but a really good example was I specifically remember wheeling my groceries around Pack and Save on a Saturday afternoon on the phone with MPI sorting out accommodation and flights for people for that weekend because people had volunteered on the Friday, were trying to sort out things like petty cash, babysitting, pulling cars from the pack house, um, and they needed to do all of that before Monday morning. So extremely responsive, very grateful for it, not only on a Friday afternoon, but throughout a weekend as well. Awesome. And last but not least, Janneke. Has anyone got any questions for Janneke? Mine's just a quick question. Uh, can we be rest assured that our border control um, are on the lookout, um, qualified, well, not so much qualified, but um, can we be rest assured that they're doing all that they can um, yeah, to spot this um, lantern fly? And yeah, that's my question. Um, absolutely. Erin um, probably is more equipped to answer this question, but I'll start off as well. Thank you. Um, part of the readiness work that you saw up there involves BNZ, which is MPI, Biosecurity New Zealand. Um, so a lot of that work is really pushing it to awareness on the front line and what to look for um, and making sure that they're aware of what they look like, um, how they might possibly come over. And, of course, the fruit pathway is quite heavily managed as well. Um, but I might pass this to Erin, sorry. I'm chucking her under the bus, but she's really well-versed in this space. Um, Janneke covered it um, really well. Um, yeah, so they are really um, well-versed. So they have, obviously, awareness materials that go out to our border staff that make them aware of what to look out for, what to look out for it on. Um, and so they're really conscious that, um, yeah, that they're, because of that, um, that waxy layer that makes it hard to fumigate, that the people are our eyes and ears at the border for this organism at the moment. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're really aware, and I think um, they do have it covered. Um, and, you know, as it gets closer, um, there might be other measures in place, but for now I think it's, it's all over it. Um, I can just add to that as well. We have a really, really good program with the Port of Tauranga, the local biosecurity New Zealand office, and KVH that involves all the frontline staff at the port here. And it's just this week that we're doing that again. We do it every single year, and we go into every staff room during a shift break or between ships, and we meet every person, and we talk to them about biosecurity. We talk to them about anything topical. And as a shameless plug for the really successful unwanted pest calendar that I see some people have already taken from the collateral table, so if there are any more out there, please do take them. But um, I actually also have a photo on my phone. One of the pests in there is the spotted lanternfly. And about 18 months ago, a very old dead one was found on the outside of a container. And the frontline worker knew that it was a spotted lanternfly, knew that he needed to report it because of the page in the calendar. So that's really, really fantastic. So um, definitely a lot of work goes on at our port to make sure that those frontline staff know exactly what to look for. Awesome. You guys are pros at this, by the way. You've bought us five minutes still. <laughs> so, Janneke, here's a question for you. What is more risky in terms of impact on crops? Fall armyworm adults or caterpillars? Fall armyworm adults or caterpillars? Yeah. In terms of apples, did you say? Sorry. Sorry, more risk in terms of impact on crop. Impacts definitely the larvae and the caterpillars, yeah. yeah. So they feed on the fruit um, and on the stems and leaves too, yeah. Awesome. And that can cause market access implications, so selling fruit. Perfect. Thank you for that. This one, I think, is probably the spotted lanternfly. You must be feeling pretty popular here, Erin. Are you aware of any research in China identifying what makes up the sooty mould on kiwi fruit due to spotted lanternfly? No, I'm not, but it is something that we have talked about um, within KVH and also um, touched on it in the steering group as well. 
um, about looking to see whether um, we need to understand that more. Julie talked a little bit about this, the sooty mould that, that they've been working on, um, and it kind of triggered a point about whether that's something we, we should focus on ourselves as well. But no, I'm unaware of any um, going on. And as a sap-sucking insect, what are the risks with the lanternfly carrying and spreading bacterial disease between plants? Yep, I think as with any sap-sucking insect, there is that risk. If, um, if the bacteria or the virus or whatever the organism is um, lives in um, the plant, then it can trans transfer. I've heard of it being a vector. I can't tell you of what because... Um, I'm not that well versed, but yes, it is. Um, there is a potential for that, and I think it depends where the organism lives in the plant as to whether um, the sap that the spotted lanternfly is is sucking um, could transmit it potentially. Cool. And I've got one final one, and this goes to Leanne and Lisa. How can we join KiwiNet if we want to? Oh, speak to us, please. Absolutely. Is there an <laughs> opportunity to do that very, very shortly in terms of morning tea? <laughs> yes, now. <laughs> Excellent. Any last minute questions, guys? We've got space for maybe one more. Well, thank you very much, guys. That was excellent. Hands together for them. Thanks very much, everyone, for um, your attention during the morning session. We now have morning tea. Um, so please move out to the foyer um, and enjoy a cup of tea and something to eat. Thanks for coming back, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed your savouries at morning tea time. Um, so next up we have Andrew McConnell, who's our National Operations and Compliance Officer at KVH. Andrew is KVH's newest staff member. He brings a wealth of experience with him in biosecurity, pest management and risk management. Andrew works with regional councils and land, landowners on the National Wild Kiwi Fruit Control Program, managing movement of risk material through the country and managing compliance in relation to the National Pathway Management Plan and the current um, Pest Management Plan for P, uh, PSA. Andrew will talk about his new work underway to spot wild kiwi fruit from space. Kia ora koutou, everybody. Um, thanks for coming here to listen to me today to talk about uh, spotting kiwi fruit from space. So where I'll spot, start is the wild kiwi fruit issue. Um, it's basically a consequence of a commercial um, planting um, and some old practices which um, happen historically, which don't really happen anymore, such as um, dumping fruit. But we've moved on from those days, and so in more recent times, the um, spread of um, wild seeds is from um, birds, wax eyes, just feeding on um, fruit which has been left on vines, or um, fruit which has been thinned or rejected that have dropped onto the orchard um, floor, um, as well as, you know, just rain events which um, have a little bit of surface flooding, and then um, carry seed into neighbouring properties and um, our gullies. Um, so, surprisingly, a lot of these vines out there in the wild, you know, they're growing in swampy, shady, damp, cold areas, but they are healthy, strong, fruiting, small and square, but still fruiting and doing surprisingly well. Um, so that creates a problem for us, especially in um, pine plantations out there. Um, it takes them back to their native homeland of China, and they do extremely well in pine plantations, as seen there on the, uh, the picture. Um, so why they're a problem for us is they're a host for um, pests and diseases. Uh, we do know PSA is present in the wild population, um, and pests you'd be familiar with, your um, passion fruit vine hopper, leaf roller, they're all out there too. And so the goal here is essentially to control the wild um, population so that then these pests and diseases can't jump from that population back into your production orchards. So that's the um, main goal, as well as if there was to be a um, new incursion, an unwanted organism or something we don't know of, it reduces the likelihood of that being sustained in that wild population and then bouncing back into production orchards. 
Um, so what we do is we have a surveillance program and a control program in the Bay of Plenty that keeps us um, busy with two teams of contractors almost working um, year-round controlling um, these vines and one um, small team out there doing surveillance looking for these vines. So I'll just um, get into a bit of detail around surveillance and the challenges we face in um, Tapuki gullies. We use two methods, so it's ground surveillance on foot and aerial surveillance through helicopters. Um, ground surveillance, you know, it's rugged terrain, steep, access is hard, um, you've got to contend with that. There's dense foliage and canopy, uh, it's time consuming, large scale, one person looking for vines. You know, it's a no small task. Um, that's where the helicopters come in to try and um, give us a bit of an aerial view. Um, it's expensive, seedlings are concealed under the canopy. Um, you do have issues of privacy and notification obligations of um, landowners. It's not too popular flying a helicopter over private land these days. Um, and you struggle a bit with accuracy. You know, it's, it's all good to be in a helicopter and fly over an infestation and GPS it, but then you're giving that data to a contractor and saying, go find this vine, and so it's very different between flying and getting into the bush and finding it. So what we have seen is um, the aerial surveillance is about 80% less effective at finding vines than the ground surveillance, but combined they do um, give us some good tools. Um, so that's where we've come into this new project, um, the satellite imagery. It offers a, a cheaper alternative. We still do have the challenges of um, seedlings being concealed under canopy, and it is a proof of concept. Um, project. So this hasn't been done before, but it has been used in um, other areas, so I'll just speak to them now. So where this all started was um, a Zespri project where they wanted to be able to identify um, G3 and Hayward um, from space um, down to precise block location, which they did successfully. Um, and what was thought to be an original um, glitch in the software where they were identifying kiwi fruit outside of the shelter belts and blocks actually turned out to be um, wild kiwi fruit. So that's where we jumped in and thought, oh, hey, this will have um, good applications for our um, project. Um, here's another example, just quickly, um, where biodiversity of tree species have been identified in an um, urban area. Another example, um, wilding pine, um, some of you might be aware, it's um, the largest weed control program in New Zealand, a big issue um, in terms of biodiversity um, values and then being impacted. Um, so this uh, technology has been trialled with wilding pines and it has been proven to be able to identify wild pines in the um, wild, but it can do that. It's in a monoculture environment, you know, easily accessible, flat, um, not as challenging as an area such as the Tapuki Gullies. Um, and it's also been used for uh, disease detection. So this example is uh, red needle blight in the forestry industry. You can see here on the picture, <coughs> the red areas are where the disease is present and the green areas are where it's absent. So that has you know, good uses for tools such as um, where you can um, send contractors in to control those areas um, and just resource and plan accordingly. Um, so one thing I did just skip over there was you have two types of imagery. There's, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in this, but there's hyperspectral and multispectral. Hyperspectral uses hundreds and up to thousands of um, colour bands, is highly capable um, and can be used for a lot of things, um, but it's also quite cost prohibitive. Um, so what we're using is multispectral, so that's your red, green, blue and um, various um, infrared um, bands. Still very capable, but a lot um, better value for money. Um, so what we're doing, it's a proof of concept project in collaboration with uh, Zespri. We're working together on this one. Um, and essentially, we just wanted to see if we can ID um, wild kiwi fruit vines from space using satellite images. Um, so how this started, um, we got out into Tapuki as the um, leaves were yellowing this um, winter, um, just before leaf drop, hoping to get a difference in um, the foliage from the yellowing to just your, your native green, so that would give us more contrast to work with in the images, which will help us train that AI to look for that difference. And sorry, when I say AI, I mean artificial intelligence. Um, so we also booked um, two different satellites 
Um, one cost, just to give you an example, about 17 cents per hectare for an image, and another one cost um, about 30 cents to 80 cents um, for an image per hectare. And um, we're doing that just to compare the capabilities of both of these um, satellites. Um, and we booked them at that time, as I said. Um, an interesting fact here is we had another company we wanted to use, actually, um, but their satellites were booked up over in um, Ukraine, and they weren't um, too interested in taking images of um, wild kiwi fruit. So we, we had to um, pivot quickly and get another one. Um, Okay, and so then the the, drown, the ground truth the ground truthing element of that involved us literally just going out into the one of the gullies between number two and um, one roads in Tapuki, finding wild kiwi fruit infestations. We spent about a day out there, located about 30 or so infestations, and we used a highly accurate um, GPS totem pole down to about one or two centimetres accuracy. And what we did is walked around these infestations, located them, and then we'll use that information to compare to the satellite images and then train the model so we can say this is 100% an infestation, this is what you need to look for, and then what the model will ho hopefully do for us is then give us a whole lot more infestations and they will be busy going out to check and verify these. So next steps, um, yeah, train this model as I um, just mentioned, We're, we'll be working on this over the next few months. Um, and another big thing of this project is building a, um, what we're calling a geospatial um, statistical model for infestation potential. So we'll just use a lot of criteria, um, say for example, 150 metres from your orchard boundary, which is the average um, distance a bird spreads the seed. Um, a pine plantation, which we know Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you found a wild kiwi fruit now. <laughs> um, a pine plantation and say a north facing slope, we can put all those criteria together so then it will give us a nice big pretty map which will have you know red spots and then we can focus our surveillance and control efforts there and then green spots where we won't focus our resourcing. Um, so yeah, outcomes. Um, essentially, we want to understand if this model can be trained to locate the wild kiwi fruit in rugged terrain. We know it can be done in the monoculture productive orchard environment. Um, so, a bit of a proof of concept. We're looking forward to see how that goes. We'll compare these two different satellites to see how they perform. Um, and if it does perform, we'll upscale this to our other growing regions within New Zealand, which will help us um, bring that wild population in. So, essentially, with um, most biosecurity programs, when you're, when you're at this stage, is you want to control your um, infestations out in the periphery, get them under control and bring it down to a, a centre, a central um, place such as our growing regions. Um, it has performance monitoring capabilities, so it's 2022. We could possibly take the same images in 2032, 2052, and compare our progress if we're winning or losing this battle of the wild kiwi fruit um, fight. And um, potential is a tool for um, wider use in biosecurity. I'll just finish on this last um, point. Um, just an example, say your orchard is in an isolated location, 50 kilometres from any other orchards. You've got some unusual symptoms or a new pest or disease, and we have no idea how it's got there. Um, potentially, we could use this sort of technology to look and see if there's any sort of corridor or wild kiwi fruit close to your orchard where these pests could be um, bunny hopping. So. Um, yeah, I'll just finish on that. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Andrew, for taking us through the challenges of the Wild Kiwi Fruit Control Program and the opportunities for surveillance in the future. So our next session is um, for demonstration run by the Zespri Global Extension Team. Um, and Robin and Sophie will take us through this. Thank you for coming back everyone and I hope you all enjoyed the demonstrations. Um, thank you to our demonstration um, hosts for your different stands. Uh, so our next presenter is Linda Peacock who is our industry liaison and technical specialist at KVH. Linda brings to KVH a great deal of knowledge having been worked in the kiwi fruit industry for 30 years both in growing and post harvest roles. Linda has a significant um, involvement in managing the relationship between KVH and the industry and runs KVH's unusual symptom reporting on Orchard. 
She'll be talking to us today about the unusual symptoms on kiwifruit vines and how these are reported and diagnosed. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Leanne. Um, thank you, everyone, for staying. <laughs> um, and so today I'm talking to you about things unusual, for no particular reason. <laughs> um, so unusual symptoms um, and the reporting of unusual symptoms from people who are out in the orchards every day, every month, every year, and across the years um, is a really important part of our um, network in terms of biosecurity, um, because you're the ones that know that um, that bit of dieback or that canker or that bit of oozing, is, is that something that I'm often seeing or is it actually something a little bit different and a little bit unusual? So as I say, the reporting those sorts of things is effectively our, um, effectively our surveillance system and it gives the best chance, therefore, of us finding things that might be new. KVH continually encourages people to come and have a chat to us or to your technical people and then to us um, about things that you might be interested in. And we're really pleased to see that the level of reporting is um, going up across the years. So over the past year, we've, we had 56 reports. So some of those get um, weeded out because they're due, to the, um, they're due to spray or environmental challenges. Some of them could be due to nutritional defects. Um, but as you can see last year, 14 of those were in that space, which left another 42 that were actually involved um, with organisms. So the process, um, it's quite simple really. You give us a call, you send us an email, um, and then we ring you up and ask you 100 questions. <laughs> um, because we need to get some sort of context to understand why the calls come through in the first place. Um, and we also, do our best to be able to paint a picture to the next people down the line, which are in fact the diagnostics labs. So we're interested in what you're seeing, where you're seeing it, how often you've been seeing it. Um, are you noticing any patterns? Is it in a particular kind of soil environment? Is it a row? Is it, is it spreading out in a circular fashion? Um, and then we connect in with the, our other technical people, which can be some of um, very experienced technical teams that are uh, throughout our post-harvest. Uh, we've got some great relationships with plant and food that we can speak to. And then, of course, um, also the guys in the diagnostic labs. Um, so samples that we do end up sending away are guided by the receiving lab, saying, OK, I think that for this, what we're looking at here, uh, I'd be keen to get some soil or maybe some cane or maybe some trunk tissue. I need this much. And generally what we're looking to do is to take a sample which is on, sitting on that edge between infected tissue and um, live tissue to get the best results. So where do we send them? So you'll be familiar that across the years, Hills Lab have done a tremendous job for us in a lot of our PSA, all of our PSA analysis, actually. Um, we've got the MPI Plant Health Environmental Lab up in Auckland, which is the big backstop of all things intelligent and diagnostic. Um, and those guys run, running the surveillance um, program across the industry ongoing, ready to take any calls across any of our primary industries regarding things that could be challenging. We also send some samples down through to plant diagnostics um, in Christchurch, and just a reminder that in those sorts of plant material movements from the North Island to the South Island all, all, always require a um, plant movement um, agreement with KVH. Plant and food research, they're obviously um, our research partners and often our unusual symptoms may also end up working into some of the projects that we've got ongoing. So away go the samples, and depending on what it is, it may take uh, sometimes up to a month. Um, that doesn't mean I've forgotten to send it. It means that it takes a month <laughs> um, to do some of the cultures. And some, occasionally we get a um, result back that indicates that it's a new diagnosis. Uh, it's, it's either a new association for kiwi fruit, or it's something new to New Zealand science. That doesn't necessarily mean we have to um, panic. What it does mean is we need to get the sample through to MPI, and, um, and then we wait for them to do their diagnostics and then an investigation to decide you know, whether we need to take any action or not. So 
The improved molecular um, diagnostics, of course, are now capable of separating out organisms which are very similar. So it means that more and more organisms are being classified as new species, despite the fact that those organisms might have been in New Zealand for some time um, or, re and, or referred to by a different name. So, so that process has gone through and then guided by what um, NPI suggest, either no actions required, or if in the event it was something that was a little bit more questionable, um, then we'd work with, M MPI would work with us as to what might be the next steps. So we've been taking unusual, unusual symptoms for four, five, six years now, um, and nothing's gone into that red box pathway. Just to give you a few ideas of the type of samples that come in, sometimes um, finds it's just a simple, a single vine in a block. So this was an unhealthy gold three plant um, which had significant, significant cankering around the um, graft union. So with the help of um, plant and food, um, we took some core samples all the way through that canker and up through the scion just to see whether that disease was traveling at all. And so you can see the core that we've taken with those darkened areas indicating um, disease organisms. So this particular sample went through to plant and food up in Mount Albert. And Joy Tyson, who's done an, a, a large amount of work for us in this space, um, she broke those cores down into little sections and then she cultured them up separately. So she gave us, a, that gives us a really good visual of what we were seeing whereabouts in that plant. So there were a number of organisms um, picked up and a number of them were considered to be more secondary invaders. Uh, one of them, Fusarium solani, was the main organism which we think was causing the disease. It was found across all the cores and it was found across all the sections that we looked at. Um, so that is just, an, well, just, it's an environmental fungi. Um, it's found worldwide and it affects a number of fruits and vegetables. So it's also not new to us in that it's popped up previously in our unusual symptoms. Um, and the fact that we keep finding that one, we don't know all that much about it, uh, that's led on to some new research. Not all of the um, symptoms that come in are caused by disease. So this one came in from um, collapse of some Gisborne vines, um, which followed hev heavy rain through the um, autumn. So it resulted in ponding on water, of water in this particular orchard, and for some of the vines that water sat for about 48 hours. The manager was quite grief stricken. He thought he'd fertilized with something maybe he shouldn't have and he'd caused a leaf burn. But in fact, that pattern of leaf collapse from the center of the vine out through to the laterals is fairly typical what you see when your vines have been suffering from anoxia um, or a lack of oxygen. So they're now um, embarking on some more drainage for that block. But to be cautious, we've taken a sample and passed it through to um, Monica. Um, for her Phytophthora survey, just to make sure there's not pathogens also in that environment. Some of the things that we get called out to are kind of more slow burn changes. So this is where you've got an orchard manager that's been on the same site for a number of years, um, and he just notices that's, that there's a change going on. So this year we got called out to this gold three block where the orchard manager noted that a lot of his um, males, both M33 and M91, were showing quite a, quite a large amount of dieback across all of his blocks. He'd seen it intermittently in his orchard in previous years, um, but this time it just seemed, and he wondered whether it was linked to the shading caused by the teepees. But when he had a closer look, he, he noticed that it was across all of his blocks now, and he also saw that when he cut some of the tissue, there, was, there appeared to be an infection. So in that case, we took some samples and again, we sent them to MPI and it came back with these uh, three fungal orga organisms. All of those um, organisms were capable of um, causing symptoms. So again, none of these were new or overly problematical apart from the fact that over time they'd built up in that canopy and they were continually pushing out spores and the environmental conditions were obviously conducive. So um, out they came. So the recommendation was they get rid of all that um, dead material, uh, take high attention to their tool hygiene, and when they did their male pruning, um, run through with a copper to follow. So at the end of the day, um, the value of reporting the unusual. You guys are actually part of our current industry surveillance system. It's the best chances of, of us finding new risks early, 
and it gives growers a good, accurate diagnostic of what's going on with their vines, which helps their management. It identifies research gaps that we might have, and we can act on those. It supports readiness programs. For example, the Phytophthora survey, the information from that feeds into a readiness plan that we develop through with MPI. At the moment, we're looking at what a future surveillance across our industry will look like, because going forward, there'll be more new varieties, we'll get more climate change, we'll be growing in more regions, and we'll be growing in areas which have previously had crops like citrus or grapes, um, things like that. So what will that mean to the host associations once we put kiwi fruit in those areas? So at the end of the day, I'd just like to encourage all of you um, to report things that are troubling you in the unusual symptoms department, um, and that can feed into our knowledge. And I'd like to uh, put a big shout out and thanks to growers who have reported to us, or technical people who have um, taken the 101 questions that I've asked them and um, helped us decide whether we need to act on um, things that are of concern. Uh, a big thanks also to the highly skilled team um, at all of the labs and our research facilities across New Zealand. I mean, there's such amazing linkages and um, opportunities for sharing and that um, confidence that um, everyone is looking to get to an answer that's useful, feasible, and that we can take forward as we go on this journey. Thank you very much. Thanks, Linda. A great reminder, if you see something unusual, um, call KVH on the 0800 number or call Linda, and she'll come and help you. <laughs> um, our next presenter is Dr. Rob Taylor. Um, Rob is a senior micro, right, microbiologist and manager of botany and bacteriology at the MPI Plant Health and Environment Laboratory in Auckland. He's in charge of diagnostic investigations and advice for bacteriology and mycology. He's looking at fungi. Rob will be talking to us today about the MPI Plant Health and Environment Lab in Auckland and receival of unusual symptom samples. Thanks, Rob. Going the wrong way. Yeah. Oh my goodness, what a failure. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk to you about the Plant Health and Environment uh, Laboratory. So, here, and I'll refer to it as PHEL. So, it resides within the Diagnostics and Surveillance Services Directorate within Biosecurity New Zealand. So we have a wide range of scientific experts at the lab that can identify a wide range of organisms, many that you've heard here today. So your serratus cystis, your fruit fly, your phytophthora. So we have virologists, bacteriologists, nematologists, and uh, botanists. Uh, we're an IANS accredited laboratory. Uh, so that accreditation is really essential for our quality management system and making sure that we have the traceability in place. Essentially, we're responsible for the identification and validation of all suspected exotic new and emerging pests and diseases affecting plants and environment. We also have a, a high-level post-entry uh, quarantine facility that enables us to bring in high-value plant germ plasm to be safely imported into New Zealand. We also provide scientific advice on biosecurity issues to support uh, surveillance, response, uh, trade and compliance programs. We also do have an applied uh, research program to underpin and improve our diagnostics capability. This is all about making sure that we keep up with uh, leading technologies in the diagnostic space and that we're equivalent to our overseas national plant protection agencies. Uh, we're in two PHLs in two locations uh, in Auckland and Christchurch, the main laboratory uh, is co-located at the moment with uh, Lang Care Research in Auckland. As well, we have a satellite lab down in Christchurch at the airport, which mainly focuses on uh, entomology diagnostics. 
Uh, we also do have another laboratory at Wallaceville that focuses on uh, animal diseases. Um, so there is an intention to build uh, a new high-level containment facility to uh, replace the current uh, laboratory, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. So this is just to give you an idea of the, uh, the span of the work that we do. So last year we completed over 125,000 tests involving samples right across all the primary industries. So diversity of samples and tests required is quite challenging. Uh, for example, we could be looking at fungal contamination on imported timber, or looking at fresh produce, uh, diseased plants, nursery stocks, seed and grains. The bulk of our work is around uh, things that we intercept at the border, uh, as well as uh, surveillance, and then providing that diagnostics during a biosecurity response. So basically we work in a in an applied diagnostic environment where test results can have significant uh, biosecurity and quarantine uh, implications. So your unusual symptom samples fall under our passive or general surveillance program, and so this is where working with growers and the public is absolutely crucial. So uh, you've heard a lot about the 0800 number. Uh, we work really closely with KVH and PHEL. Sorry. Uh, this is an area where KVH and PHEL work closely together. So you've heard of some of the key benefits. So early detection will result in a greater chance of eradication. But probably quite important is that it provides the baseline data on what is present in New Zealand, which also helps support our assurances that we provide to our trading partners that we're free of certain uh, pests. It also provides data on background microflora and pre-existing disorders uh, or diseases that could potentially mask symptoms and interfere with the diagnosis of an unwanted organism. So this is particularly important, having that information during a biosecurity investigation so we can work out if something's actually new to New Zealand. Now I'm just going to take you briefly through the laboratory diagnostic process. But um, So when kiwi fruit samples arrive in the lab, the samples are accessioned on arrival. It's given a unique barcode to ensure traceability through that process. Then a diagnostician will assess that sample. So if it's a kiwi fruit sample, one of the things that we do is we cross-check against K KVH's unwanted pest list to ensure the symptoms don't align with something uh, that we don't want present here in New Zealand. Um, if we saw symptoms that were that matched one of those unwanted uh, pathogens, we actually would have a specific DNA test where we could test that sample straight away and get a result in the next one or two days. Uh, a lot of the samples that we're getting from Linda, uh, we actually don't know what's in the sample, so then we have to take that plant tissue and actually extract the fungi and bacteria into culture. Once we get that pure culture, we can do a range of tests from uh, morphological identification of fungal spores or biochemical testing, uh, in particular uh, molecular testing is quite advanced in the lab, so that can run from specific PCR tests through to Sanger sequencing right through to uh, genome testing. So for complex samples, this process can take up to three weeks. But just to point out, if it was something like, say, PSA or serratocystis, we can actually get a result in one to two days because we've got the molecular tests in place. And this is a body of work that KVH has also been doing research on. So for example, they recently developed a, a molecular test for serratocystis from Beata. Uh, this is just to give you an indication of some of the previous detections that we've had. So Linda's done a, a really good overview, but we, we have seen a wide range of symptoms Example, leaf spots, uh, swollen trunk, decaying roots, cankers, and we have to use quite a multi-tiered approach to identify what's causing this. Um, Neonectria kiwi fruit canker is a good example of where s surveying for unusual symptoms uh, help detect a potential emerging pathogen. So this is where a grower noticed canker symptoms on their vine, uh, went to KVH with these unusual symptoms, they did assessment and then sent these samples to MPI. So that was around in 
2015, and we identified Neonectria microconidium, which was a relatively recently new described species. So um, at that time, we were, we were a little bit concerned that it was a potential uh, new arrival or new to New Zealand, but actually working in with plant and food, um, we were able to show that um, it is pre had been present in New Zealand for several years, probably at least since uh, 2001. So that was the first time that uh, Neonectria microconidia had been detected on causing canker on G3 vines. So that example is, is actually shows the good collaborations that are in place between KVH and MPI and plant and food research to help identify and understand potential biosecurity uh, issues. So as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, an intention to build a new PHEL facility. Um, this is subject to uh, cabinet decision and we still have a, a long way to go. But the, the design phase is underway and the current proposal is to locate the new facility at the Mount Albert uh, Research Centre in Auckland, um, co-located with plant and food research. So the intention is for the new facility to house um, a greater number of staff and substantially increase the available greenhouse space. And what this will enable us to do is increase the number of cultivars and new germplasm that can be released each year. Uh, currently, we have about a five-year uh, backlog uh, for new germplasm. So, oops, last one. So importantly, uh, alongside an increase in space and staff numbers, there is a strong focus on making sure that the new facility uh, will be future-proofed. So it'll enable us to deal with the potentially changing demand in the biosecurity space, and this is due to things such as uh, climate change and new pests and diseases, uh, new trading and free trade agreements, as well as the increasing demand for import, for importing uh, new genetic material. So at the moment, we're working through the design with national and international experts on latest ideas around laboratory and greenhouse design. This will enable us to uh, pick up new technologies as well as uh, process more samples than we currently do. Um, so this is a really early impression of how the finished uh, facilities uh, might look, but the, the focus at this moment is on uh, resilience and flexibility and the ability to adapt uh, when we have ch new threats. So some of the things that it will be able to do is um, we'll have more capability to work on biosecurity issues, but um, it will increase our uh, throughput in terms of number of tests when we go into a surge during biosecurity. So, for example, we can process, uh, depending on the host and the pathogen, about a thousand tests a day, if we're lucky. Um, with the new facility, uh, it would be in the space of five to seven thousand um, samples, which would be ideal if we we're really unlucky to have uh, two large biosecurity responses at the same time. And so, yeah. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, it's great to be here, and thanks for your time. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Thanks for your presentation, Rob, providing an overview of the diagnostics that supports the unusual symptom process and the new Plant Health and Environment Laboratory. Always great to see investment going into plant health and not just the animal side of things. <laughs> um, so that brings us to the end of our um, session of presentations today. Um, thank you everyone for attending and listening and learning about the great work that's been going on contributing to the kiwifruit biosecurity resilience. Thank you to our presenters and demonstrators for taking the time to come and share your knowledge with us today. And a big thanks to the organisers, so the KVH staff and the Zespri staff from the Innovation and Global Extension team. Um, if you could please refer to your agenda, you can scan the QR code to leave feedback about how the event went today. All your feedback is appreciated. We do have lunch served for you in the foyer. Um, this is a great time to connect and ask the presenters and demonstrators any burning questions that you may have, as well as enjoying some lunch. So thanks again for coming today, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of it. Thanks.